holds its third in a series of hearings on this issue and looks at the role of political parties in federal elections. Republican National Committee Chairman Halle Barber and Democratic National Committee Chairman Don Fowler testify first. A little later, several political science professors and state political party leaders testify. Congressman Bill Thomas chairs the three-hour hearing. I know you were interviewed extensively. The committee will come to order. I want to welcome uh, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, Haley Barber, and the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Don Fowler, the other witnesses, guests, in the media. Uh, this is the third of our series of hearings on campaign finance reform, and obviously our goal is to provide as thorough a hearing as possible, reviewing those key areas in campaign finance that people believe should be reformed. Uh, one of the things that we want to try to minimize, we can never um, remove it entirely, but to minimize the unintended consequences, which I believe have been a significant uh, part of uh, campaign finance, especially since the 1970s. And one of our greater concerns is that when you take a look at any recent public opinion poll, for example, a Campaign for America recently asked, which of the following do you think really controls the federal government in Washington? 25% answered the Republicans in Congress, 6% answered the President, 6% answered the Democrats in Congress, but 49% responded lobbyists and special interests. 90% uh, in this same survey agreed with the statement, uh, we need campaign finance reform to make politicians accountable to average voters rather than special interests. No matter how accurate or inaccurate, someone's message is getting through uh, to the voters. And so when we make difficult choices about the role and the cost of government, I believe it's absolutely critical that the American people have confidence in the process that elects their representatives. I also believe that political parties have a crucial role to play in restoring the confidence of citizens in representative government. There have been a number of significant changes in campaigning. Obviously, television is right at the top. The approach to retailing candidates, I think, is significant as well, the professionalization uh, of campaigns. But I believe a major impact was either the intended or the unintended consequences of reform, quote unquote, legislation of the 1970s. Uh, the first chart we have available, and I believe there are uh, copies available to folk uh, so that they can look at them from their seats, is basically what occurred uh, in the House, and we're focusing on the House in campaign financing, uh, through political parties, basically in that period pre-war to the so-called reform era. Uh, you had the Hatch Act Amendments of 1940 uh, and the dollar amount effects uh, on the political parties. But the real impact comes, I think, with the next chart in what's commonly called the Reform Era, as I said, in which you had major restructuring. You dealt with contributions to party committees, limiting the amount in federal accounts that could be spent, uh, the direct candidate support by party committees, in essence, turning parties into what I'll call super PACs, federal accounts for national parties, and then the non-federal accounts, or so-called soft money uh, accounts, which are uh, used for non-federal purposes of administrative costs, generic voter drives, and the other items listed above. But the net effect of this campaign finance reform was to, as I said, turn American political parties into super PACs. The key difference between political action committees and political parties was that the political party's participation was mutually exclusive. That as an individual was either a Democrat or a Republican, they contributed to either the Republican or the Democrat party. The Democratic party would back its own particular candidates and the Republican party would back its own particular candidates. But political action committees in which an individual could contribute to a number of political action committees were not limited to a mutually exclusive game. They could give to a number 
of candidates. In fact, uh, they could give to incumbents and the challengers, which a number of them have done and do do, which results in this kind of a picture of contributions to federal candidates. That dotted line near the bottom, which remains near the bottom, are the party contributions to candidates. The solid line are the PAC contributions to federal candidates, driven largely by the multiplication of PACs. The chart starts in 1980. There were about 2,500 political action committees, and the chart leads through 1994, in which there were almost 4,000 political action committees. So although PACs are limited in the amount that they can contribute to candidates, the number of PACs is not limited. And of course, the major political parties have remained the same. That creates that kind of an anomaly in contributions and leads some groups to say that PACs are now the dominant force in the system. And I find ironic that when I examined their campaign finance reform suggestions, there is no mention of, quote unquote, unleashing the political parties so that they could participate more openly and fully as they had done in the past. If you, though, trace the full amount of federal disbursements from political parties and PACs, you find a much more comparable comparison of the dollar amounts uh, that are spent on campaigns. So it means that the cost of operating a political party, of the overhead and maintenance, takes a considerable amount of money today, and that the law limits the amount that could be put in the field for candidates. My concern is, as we go forward with campaign finance reform, that we examine the role of political parties. Uh, I believe that the trend that was developed in the 1970s uh, should be reversed. I believe political parties are not only unique, but extremely valuable institutions in this democracy. They transcend single issues, which I think is critical today, or so-called special interests, or even charismatic candidates. Political parties, I think, are a leavening and a supporting force in the political system. For the average citizen of modest means, I think political parties are the gateway to political participation and leadership. Just from a personal reflection, my involvement in politics began uh, officially as a county chairman uh, in California uh, in volunteer politics. So I'm especially proud to have before us as the first two witnesses uh, two men who've dedicated much of their adult lives to the service of their respective political parties. Uh, and I look forward to uh, their testimony. Uh, gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to join you in welcoming Haley Barber and Don Fowler. I, I truly appreciate them taking uh, their time to engage in this discussion of uh, where the campaign laws should go, not just campaign finance, but to all those related to the subject at hand. And I want to congratulate the chairman for making this part of the series of hearings that we're having on this subject. I don't believe we've spent much time looking at the state of the party in recent years, and I think it's long overdue that we do so. I would urge my colleagues, including the two uh, chairmen, to look at uh, a monograph that the chairman presented, which uh, covers his political career. I'm not sure I agree with all his analysis of California political history, although much of it. But I think I truly agree with him that we need to reinvigorate the two major parties, and he makes some very interesting suggestions along those lines. We have talked a lot about campaign finance reform over the last three or four Congresses, talking about financing and influencing the process here, but we simply have uh, allowed the issue of party membership and accountability to be overshadowed by the more high-profile debate over PACs and spending limits. We've allowed what has been an academic debate to remain in the groves of academe, and we're going to hear from some of the people who um, have been conducting that debate at a sub rosa level here in a minute. I'm hopeful that that participation today will help move the debate out into the political mainstream where I think members of Congress must be engaged in this uh, process of thinking about where we go with parties, both at the national and the state level. Uh, there isn't any question, as Larry Sebedo has accurately put it, that there are no more unappreciated institutions in American life than the two major political parties. And I think there's a lot of truth to that. We have forgotten 
what parties have done to our democracy throughout history. In fact, I think the degree to which uh, the party's influential role has declined in recent decades is a direct correlation with the changes in the campaign laws, particularly how we fund our campaigns, as well as, of course, as the chairman has already indicated, the degree to which we have replaced foot power with television and moved away from the involvement of individuals in the grassroots activities that used to be the hallmark of uh, what political parties were all about. I think we allowed political parties to take part of the hit for what people thought was wrong with the political system, the machine, the smoke-filled room. It all seemed to people to be a bit of a throwback to uh, Tammany Hall or some element of the political process that both parties at one time or place were dominant in that seemed to be a negative impression of how decisions were made closing out people, not including them. It doesn't have to be that way. It hasn't always been that way. And I think uh, perhaps if we can find some agreement within this committee as we try to uh, fix what's wrong with the uh, current laws that we're governed by, we ought to be aware of how we can reinvigorate the party. And I don't think there's any question that part of that is how we get more money to the parties and how parties can participate more in the way in which members uh, earn their funds and therefore uh, have the ability to compete in political contests between the two parties. Historically, our two parties have been part of the way in which we have come to consensus in this country. We work out our problems given the big tent that each party represents, and then we try to bring people who can appeal to the center as well as to the two sides of the political spectrum. We have, I think, allowed the party system to deteriorate far too much, and it's time, as the chairman's uh, attention to this hearing indicates, that we come back and take another look and see what we can do to uh, bring back one of the most important institutions in our political system to a, perhaps a more central role in the future of our country. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And once again, I want to welcome the uh, chairman of our two major parties, and I would tell you that any written testimony you have will be made a part of the record, and you can address us in any way you see fit that would inform us for uh, a relatively uh, open period of time. I would indicate that at 11 o'clock uh, there is a joint session of Congress to hear the Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Perez. We will recess uh, at 11 and reconvene uh, at noon. Uh, and so, uh, Chairman of the National Republican Party, Mr. Barber. Chairman, uh, Congressman Fazio. Uh, I would also tell you, Haley, that these microphones are lousy, so you need to pull them and speak directly into them. Uh, technology is not yet uh, reached. You might even want to angle it up toward your, uh, toward your mouth. There you go. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Congressman Fazio. Thank you for having me to address the committee. and. And let me first express my appreciation to the two of you for recognizing the important and unique role that political parties play in American politics. As Congressman Fazio said, uh, the two-party system has been one of the principal ingredients of stable American democracy uh, for the entire history, uh, or at least dating back to early in the 19th century. Uh, I appreciate both of your talking about the need to strengthen political parties. Uh, let me say for perhaps our viewers, a political party is an association of like-minded people who debate issues, who attempt to influence government policy, and who work together to elect like-minded people to local, state, and federal office. Uh, it is not a special interest group in that not everybody agrees on everything. As Congressman Fazio rightly said, both parties are big tents. Uh, they are diverse. They are broad. The Republican Party is the conservative part of the United States. The Democratic Party is the liberal part of the United States. But both parties are diverse parties. Uh, parties do provide voters with a starting point in, in, as they sh make decisions about who should be elected to office, that the, the voters can get a general idea of what a candidate must be for by the parties affiliated with. As uh, maybe you know, I'm from Mississippi, and I grew up in a state where we had a multifactional one-party system. And the voters literally could not identify who the different candidates 
uh, were allied with. I can remember very well in 1971 in my state, the people who were surrounding the incumbent governor, who was not allowed to run for re-election, ran the campaign of one of the potential successors. And they ran a campaign on sweep the rascals out. Well, they were the rascals. But because we had a multifactional one-party system, a candidate could run for governor with the support of the people who are running the state government and be the reform candidate because the lack of a two-party system in our state at the time kept the voters in the dark as to who was on whose side. Let me talk about our own party for a moment. Uh, the Republican Party, by its very organization, is a grassroots, bottom-up organization. Uh, it is not organized from the top down. It is a federation of state parties. It's directed from the local level up, not from the top down. Uh, this is evidenced both by the way it is created under the rules of the Republican Party and also because of this, it is the epitome of a First Amendment association which has a unique and responsible role in our democratic process. The Republican National Committee represents millions of Republican voters, hundreds of thousands of Republican volunteers, scores of thousands of Republican activists who come together to choose the leadership of our party, thousands of party officials at the local, state, and federal level, national level, and also thousands of office holders at the local, state, and federal level. And I want to emphasize this. The Republican National Committee is also the party of mayors and city councilmen, of legislators and governors. It is not just the party of congressmen, senators, and presidents. I want to allude to something Congressman Fazio said because I think it's very important. Uh, as a party, we not only spend money trying to elect candidates per se, but we try to spend money to keep people involved and informed. As I said at the beginning of my testimony, a political party debates issues and attempts to influence public policy. Uh, we spend a considerable amount of money every year trying to make our membership, our leadership, membership right down to the grassroots, informed about public policy and to give them a voice in public policy. We spend money on more than just giving campaign contributions. Uh, we're trying to use technology, Congressman Fazio, to involve people in politics. You are so right that over the years people have used technology to try to replace people in politics. We've been as guilty of it as anybody. And we have tried to learn in recent years how to use technology to involve people. We did a survey in 1993 where we sent a, a survey to 800,000 Republican households and the first sentence in the letter said, don't send money. Then after they recovered from that. Uh, we, we had a 156 question, 29 section survey that cost us nearly $500,000 by the time we sent it out, got it back in, tabulated it, published it, and sent the responses to the 134,000 people who took the time to respond. We have our own television studio and air a one hour weekly TV show. Uh, we use television to try to communicate with our leadership. We have a website on the internet, as the Democratic National Committee does, as a way to try to give people more information. Our party, I mentioned, is organized from the bottom up. Uh, there is no RNC Inc. The party is organized every four years by the Republican National Convention. It literally is reestablished and recreated every four years by the delegates of that convention, and it operates from, from every four years under the rules passed at the last national convention, rules that I cannot change, uh, rules that are passed by the grassroots, rep the representatives of the grassroots of our party. So the rules passed in Houston in 92 will be our rules till San Diego of 96 when all that will be reestablished according to the views of the delegates to the 96 convention. We have 165 members on our national committee, uh, a committee man and a committee woman from each state, plus the state chairman of the state party from each of the 50 states, the territories, and the District of Columbia. Our committee meets twice a year. We have an executive council that meets four times a year. 
Uh, when we meet, we discuss strategy. We give the representatives of the grassroots a voice in determining where we're headed, how we raise our money, how we spend our money. Let me get to a moment on campaign finance reform, since I know that is one of the focuses of where you are headed. The first thing I want to emphasize to you is campaign finance reform should not be viewed with the notion that politically political parties, the RNC or the DNC, is narrowly focused on federal activity. That's simply wrong. I mentioned earlier, we're not just the party for congressmen and senators. The RNC, the Republican National Committee, is the party organization for governors, legislators, county commissioners, city councilmen, mayors, and all these others. We have, the Republican National Committee has no problem with Congress or the federal government properly regulating federal election related activities, either through legislation or rulemaking. The regulation of state and local political activity is another matter. Uh, it's altogether fitting and proper for Congress to require an allocation of our expenditures in a way that party expenditures that impact on federal elections should be so allocated and covered by, paid for only by federal funds, uh, funds raised in compliance with the Federal Election Campaign Act. But it is, I should note, the Federal Election Commission already does this. And we have no, we have no objection to proper regulation of what we do with costs allocated to federal candidates. We oppose the federal government however, preempting state law and usurping the state's authority to conduct and regulate elections for state and local office. And that would be the practical effect of one of the things that has been talked about in terms of campaign finance reform. That is the ban of the use of any non-federal money by the national committees. Uh, non-federal money is sometimes described as soft money or party soft money. It is money that is legally raised to support non-federal candidates and non-federal activities of the parties. Uh, for the Republican National Committee, every penny we raise in non-federal funds is disclosed and reported in exactly the same way as the funds we raise for federal activities. Similarly, every penny we spend on behalf of non-federal activities the expenditure is reported in exactly the same way as that that we do for, uh, for federal candidates. The difference is some funds can be used in federal campaigns, others cannot. Let me just mention to you, 45 states elect governors the same time they have federal elections. Uh, when the Republican National Committee in 1994 worked to, for us to elect 30 Republican governors, lieutenant governors, attorneys general, 469 new states, uh, seats in state legislatures. We contributed a substantial amount of money in non-federal money to our part, local parties, our state parties, our local candidates, and our state candidates. The fact of the matter is $23 million in non-federal funds were used for those kinds of activities. Every penny reported, every penny uh, uh, reported as to how it was spent. In 1993 and 1995, when there were no federal elections at all, we spent millions of dollars supporting Republican candidates for governor and the legislature in the various states. My point to you is we recognize the right and the need for Congress and the federal government to regulate or take whatever activity you want about federal campaigns. We very much oppose usurpation of the state campaigns. And Congressman, if I could make one more point. You mentioned unintended consequences. And, and I want to emphasize what is at the end of my prepared testimony. I urge you, as you consider things like spending limits, what's the proper thing to do about contribution limits that Congressman Fazio uh, alluded to, please be careful of the unintended consequences. The public, as you said, Mr. Chairman, uh, is concerned about special interest influence. There are essentially three ways American people get information about politics and public policy. Through campaigns and parties, through special interest groups, and through the news media. Those are the three, virtually every bit of information people get comes from one of those three. 
when you limit or otherwise even reduce the amount of spending by campaigns and parties, then necessarily you increase the power and influence of special interests. Uh, you, in, you know, today you've seen millions of dollars of non-campaign money spent attacking the Republican budget, principally by labor unions, totally uncovered by the, by the uh, campaign law. Yet, if you limit how much Congressman X or Senator Y can spend on that campaign, you increase the influence of the special interests who are paying for this issue advertising. Please do not make the mistake of limiting free speech, free association, and, and, and the ability of campaigns and parties to participate because the necessary effect is to make special interests more powerful and influential and to give the news media even greater control over the flow of information that people have about politics and public policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Barber, uh, next, the uh, Chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Mr. Fowler. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Fazio, thank you very much for the opportunity of being here. It's a pleasure to appear before you today to discuss the role of political parties in our system of government and to highlight some of the issues I believe should be considered in the current debate on campaign finance reform with respect to the treatment of political parties. To summarize at the outset, the President has made clear his strong commitment to reforming our campaign finance system. We are proud of the commitment and of the hard work the President has already put into this challenging endeavor. Together with lobbying and ethics reforms on which this administration and Congress have already made significant progress, reforming the campaign finance system is something we have to do as a part of a massive ta task of restoring confidence of ordinary citizens to the institutions of government. Democracy does not and cannot work when vast numbers of people believe the government no longer belongs to them. During the 30 years of my involvement with the Democratic Party, I have witnessed a significant weakening of the parties as institutions and a decline in their role in American political life. It used to be that parties were one of the key means by which citizens felt connected to the people who represent them. Because the parties provided most of the resources their candidates needed to get elected and re-elected, candidates were directly dependent on parties and once in office felt obligated to the party leadership in the Congress and the legislative bodies. The result was a linkage between the people, the party, and elected officials that has been sorely lacking in recent years. Television, an increasingly mobile population, the role of political action committees and other factors have caused a diminution in party effectiveness. Politics, as nature, abhors a vacuum. So political parties have been replaced by special interest groups, political consultants of all sorts, and mass electronics communications. If this trend has been a, an unhealthy one for our dem democracy, then surely part of the solution is to find ways to strengthen the parties as institutions and to enhance and expand their role in American political life. I fundamentally believe that strong political parties are essential to a sound, responsive, and responsible democratic political system. As a party leader, we have a special responsibility to seek means of strengthening parties and improving their functions. With that background, let me turn to some, to some fundamental principles that I believe should guide the Congress in formulating campaign finance reform legislation. As the President has articulated, real campaign finance reform must limit campaign spending, restore the role of special interest, including PACs, open up the airwaves to all candidates, and ban the use of soft money by federal candidates. And I believe it is essential to accomplish these goals in a way that strengthens rather than weakens the political parties. I would, make special, I would make several specific suggestions in this regard. First, the current provisions that allow state parties to undertake grassroots volunteer activities, which are at the heart of our party campaign operations, should be maintained and, if possible, expanded. It is essential to provide adequate resources for state and local parties. 
Denied, to deny them adequate resources will destroy the probability that we will have effective political parties in the United States. Second, the amounts an individual is permitted to contribute to candidates and parties should be increased to new levels that reflect the impact of inflation since the current law was enacted, with those limits adjusted periodically for inflation as the spending limits in the presidential financing system already are. The $1,000 limit was set in the mid-1970s. It is now worth about one-third of what it was then. Third, while it is essential to ban so-called soft money contributed to help federal candidates, this should be accomplished in a way that ensures that party organizations have su sufficient resources to carry out campaign activities, including, in particular, grassroots activities for their candidates. The President's original proposal of 1993 to create state party grassroots funds is an example of the kind of approach that would achieve these goals, and there may be other approaches worthy of exploring. Finally, I would urge that any reform measure be kept as simple as possible. The touchstone of this exercise will be whether we have succeeded in restoring public confidence in our electoral and political system. That goal becomes more difficult to the extent ordinary citizens cannot understand the system or how it can be changed. At the same time, it is important to avoid placing unnecessary regulatory and compliance burdens on our national, state, and local organizations, which can only serve to discourage these organizations from playing a more active role. In closing, Mr. Chairman, let me say that the Democratic National Committee stands ready to work with your committee and its staff in developing a bipartisan campaign finance reform, reform bill that will achieve real reform while strengthening the political parties. I know the President remains more strongly committed than ever to seeing this task completed during this current session of Congress. And if this Congress can accomplish that task, you will have rendered an enormous service to the American people, and you will have done much to brighten the future of our democracy. Thank you very much, and I would be pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, that's the end of my formal statement, Mr. Chairman, but I would like to comment on one thing that you said and, and Mr. Barber referred to. Uh, my green light's still on, so I still have a couple of minutes, I guess. E even if it's not, you can keep okay. on going. Uh, you used the term parties are super PACs, and in context, I agree with you, they have in part become super PACs. But I have a fundamental belief that parties are much more than super PACs. Parties are organizations that seek to link the people with government. Uh, parties for a long time did that very well. For the reasons which I indicated in my testimony, uh, that linkage has been weakened considerably. I believe that you will face, I know that you will face, alternatives in how you structure this campaign finance reform legislation. You can structure it so that a person may give to a party a certain amount of money and to a candidate a certain amount of money, or that a party may engage in certain activities but may not engage in other activities. I would suggest that a proper balance in that regard would involve giving parties more opportunity to raise larger amounts of funds than candidates, because I think the work of parties underlie the campaigns of all of the candidates who, who offer on that ticket. And I think that parties, uh, not only in campaign periods, but throughout the years of election and non-election periods, parties should be at work educating the public, building organizations, strengthening the linkage between government and the people. And that takes resources over and above what's required to campaign by a candidate. There are alternatives also in how you allocate campaign funds. For example, uh, the money that goes now to presidential candidates who are uh, pursuing the nomination, and particularly the money that goes to, cam to candidates who are proceeding, pr pr pursuing election in the general election, goes to the can candidates and not to the parties. 
uh, I don't suggest and I'm not suggesting that you reverse that. What I am suggesting is that was an alternative that was made in 1974 that enhanced the role of candidates significantly and decreased the influence of parties. I repeat, I'm not suggesting that you reverse that. I am just using that as an illustration of how the choices you make will have a variable influence on candidates and parties. And I strongly suggest and urge that you give full consideration to adequately funding the parties because the parties do have a broader responsibilities, a broader set of responsibilities than candidates do in the narrow confines of a campaign as important as those functions are. Parties are part of the hope of restoring the faith of the American people in this system of government. And I think that you, in writing this campaign finance uh, reform legislation, should keep that in mind and provide parties, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, with the, with the wherewithal to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Fallon. I want to assure you that in my statements in referring to political parties as super PACs, what I was trying to do was to reflect what I thought was the result of the legislation. I certainly do not agree with it. I agree with you. Political parties are unique institutions, and unfortunately, I don't believe there was adequate knowledge in the 1970s about the complete and unique role of political parties in not only recruiting candidates but getting them elected and then programming public policy and the issues education that the parties do uh, and that the limits that were placed on the ability of political parties uh, to get funds uh, I think significantly hampered parties in a negative way and relatively enhanced those special interests and that when people are looking for changes in the system I think unleashing political parties or freeing them from the current legislation would go a long way towards solving our problems. Uh, the chart I have up now are the contribution limits, and uh, I'll refer to that in a minute, but I do want to make an observation. The chairman and the ranking member are from California, which is traditionally a weak party state because of the Hiram Johnson progressive changes in the early 20th century. I couldn't help but note that the chairman of the National Republican Party and the chairman of the uh, National Democratic Party both have accents that tells me they're from a region uh, of the country that has traditionally had strong party structure, whether it be a single party, as you indicated, Mr. Barber, uh, or a two-party system. You have seen a history of candidates relating to political parties in the state and nationally that many people who are now in public office have not had an opportunity to participate in. Historically, for example, from the very beginning for the ranking member and myself in California, but for many of the members of Congress who were elected in the 80s and even now more recently in the 90s, they don't know, if you'll excuse me, what political parties are supposed to look like because of the limiting uh, legislation in your ability to participate significantly or I might even say in any meaningful way in their uh, uh, run for office and that I think is something that needs to be changed and changed significantly on the first line uh, you have the individual donor candidate committee a thousand dollars Mr. Fowler you indicated that it's worth maybe slightly more than three hundred dollars today then the PACs at five thousand which would be more like sixteen hundred dollars today but then you have the local party committee and the state party with that same five thousand uh, dollars uh, but once again the PACs are times four thousand and the parties are only one one yesterday one today and in all likelihood uh, one tomorrow national party committee gets twenty thousand dollars per year uh, from individuals but the overall limit is twenty five thousand have you had any um, reaction or reflection on those numbers? Have you, as committees, looked at those numbers? Would you simply draw a line through them and leave it open-ended uh, as um, a, a way to determine how much should be contributed? It's between the individual and the party. After all, that money is filtered through the party if it's individual money and spent to where the party believes it's uh, uh, most appropriate to spend it. 
Or would you add a multiplier of three, which would be an inflation factor, and tie it to inflation? Uh, what would be, uh, in, in your opinion, uh, a reasonable adjustment to that top line in terms of contributions to parties? Any reaction at all? Well, Don said in his testimony, and I agree, that uh, these have never been adjusted for inflation. And at a very minimum, they should be adjusted for inflation. Uh, I want to emphasize, however, that we're talking here about limits for contributions to candidates for federal office, which is absolutely within the purview of the federal government to regulate. Uh, we would oppose any federal limitation on contributions or expenditures on behalf of candidates for state and local office. You're both from California, and the state of California chooses to allow unlimited contributions, chooses to allow corporate contributions. My home state of Mississippi allows corporate contributions but limits them to $1,000. Other states don't allow corporate contributions at all. Those states have every right to have whatever camp to regulate their campaigns and have whatever campaign laws for state and local elections. And if it's, I don't mean to say this the wrong way, the federal government has no right to take that authority away from them. So to, to adjust these for inflation as a minimum, but to also be very plain that we would oppose any limitation by the federal government on contributions or expenditures for state offices, remembering that we have to abide by those state laws. And if New Jersey has a different law from California, money that goes to New Jersey has to comply with its law, Mississippi, California, regardless. So that's the, the one thing I want to make as a, as a punctuation to the idea of indexation or, or moving up. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I don't recognize that Mr. Bar Barber has any accent. I just wanted to point that out. <laughs> Uh, I do believe that the uh, contributions from uh, uh, individuals should be increased. I mean, if you had to, if you asked me for a number, I would say twenty-five hundred dollars. Uh, but uh, there's nothing sacred about that. But uh, that brings it close to where it, uh, it was in purchasing terms in ninety in seventy-four. Um, we believe that uh, PACs uh, should not be able should not contribute. So uh, uh, that's our position on that. With respect to limitations uh, from uh, uh, local committees, or if I understand, uh, that's uh, the amount an individual can contribute now to local and state parties. I would. Uh, uh, that varies from state to state by state law, as you know, and in, as Mr. Barber pointed right. out, it, it it varies all over the the, the lot. I would. Um, um, leave the um, funding of uh, the parties at the national level uh, to the individuals. Um, I would not uh, permit uh, uh, PACs to make contributions to parties at the national level, as I would not permit them to, to make uh, contributions to, to candidates. What, what uh, about the amount an individual can now contribute to the national party? Is it too radical to suggest we should remove any limit on that amount? Oh, I think that uh, there is uh, lots of room to, uh, to uh, discuss that. If you had to ask me for a sum, I would say that an individual, an individual, uh, not a corporation, not a PAC, should be able to permit to contribute uh, in the range of twenty dollars to $25,000 to a national party. My concern is that in your, in your written statement, um, and I believe you, you said it verbally, Mr. Fowler, that you wanted to um, deny soft money to political parties. Uh, and my concern is how, how necessary is that money today in carrying out the informational and education role or even the administrative support role that would otherwise consume dollars that could be spent directly in federal elections and that would you not want to free up um, the amount an individual could voluntarily give to in essence offset the loss of money that would come to a party if we in fact denied the soft money. Uh, in the 103rd Congress, the Republican Conference uh, as the then minority had a position of uh, not allowing soft money to be expended in federal elections. Um, 
we were concerned about the impact that would have on the educational and uh, uh, issue promotion of the parties uh, and therefore uh, felt very strongly uh, that we should free up other sources uh, of money, kind of unleash the PACs with much less control on the dollar amounts from the federal level. Any reaction to soft money, the denial of soft money, the replacement of uh, necessary expenses by individual voluntary contributions, either of you? Well, the, there are a number of factors at play here, and I don't want to be too lengthy in my response to your question. One of the most significant factors is uh, party operations. Another, just as important, is the confidence that the public has in the system. And I believe that the system to regain public confidence has to be simple. And that's why I think the parties uh, should be limited to individual contributions, just as candidates should. I think that if you break that rule, uh, it's going to become so confusing that the public will not understand it, and therefore not understanding it will not have faith in it. Uh, to your point, as I understand the specific point of your question, Parties do have to have enough money to operate on. Uh, what that sum of money is, is unclear. Uh, our budget, uh, our operational budget for this year is somewhere in the vicinity of $40 million. Uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, Mr. Barber has more than that uh, available to him. Um, we would like to have as much as he does. I think that a party can operate on the, effectively, a national party effectively can operate in the on the sum in the area of 40 to 50 million. Uh, we do use soft money now, as you know. Uh, I think that if we limited our proceeds uh, to individuals in the range of $25,000, we would work harder on individuals and we could raise that kind of money. Uh, another consideration, Mr. Chairman, is the degree to which a political party uh, becomes obligated to uh, those who give large sums of money. Now, I have never taken a dollar from anybody, nor have I ever known anybody to give a dollar with some precondition to it. But uh, if somebody gives you $100,000, and we do have people who give us that much money, um, there's a special relationship created, I guess you would say, that, that you will answer that person's telephones, that person's telephone calls. And I'm not sure that's a healthy situation. Uh, I think that uh, if you lowered the, the amount, uh, if you uh, did a better job of spreading the base, and while we haven't talked about this yet, if you do a better job of uh, getting small contributions primarily through direct mail, you would have a healthier party system. Mr. Chairman, I come at this from a different perspective and have a different response. L let me say at the outset, less than 25 percent of all the money raised by the Republican National Committee in the last election cycle was non-federal money, so-called soft money. Every penny reported, not a penny of it spent on federal elections. Uh, I agree with the idea that we should not <clears throat> allow the spending of non-federal contributions on federal elections. We don't do that. What I disagree with is the idea that because you're electing a governor of California at the same time you're having a Senate race, that that makes all the money spent in California spent on a federal election. Uh, you elect the entire legislature. You elect the governor, the attorney general, the lieutenant governor. Uh, and if the state of California allows corporate contributions, then the Democratic and Republican National Committees ought to be able to raise corporate contributions to give to help elect Republican candidates for state office in California. We are not just the party committee for federal candidates. But even though I come at it from a different angle, and over 70% of my revenue in the last two years came in contributions of $100 or less, 2.6 million contributions totaling $103 million, about $40 per contribution over 70% of the revenue and contributions of $100 or less, and PACs gave us less than 1% of our party revenue, I still think it is absolutely wrong for Congress to outlaw non-federal contributions to the national parties 
because we are still the parties that participate in state and local elections, and, and Congress should not prevent us <clears throat> from raising and making legal contributions in California if the California <clears throat> authorities think that's right. So even though we raise very little soft money compared to the Democrats, and primarily do raise our money in the way Don was talking about from small donors, I still don't think that, that Congress has the authority or would accomplish anything positive by taking over the running of state elections or cutting us off from state and local candidates. Because even though it's only about 20 some percent of my revenue, that is most of the money that we give to governor's candidates. And we gave millions of dollars to governor's candidates and legislative candidates and mayoral candidates. It's mostly out of that money. It's all legal, all reported. And, and this would really damage the link, the vertical organization of our party. Mr. Chairman, may I, may I comment on, on that just a second? You certainly, uh, man. I just do want to comment. We have several minutes left. And I apologize, the gentleman from California, Mr. Fazio, because I'm sure he wants to ask some questions. But both of us are going to submit extensive written questions to the parties in looking for areas where there, there is agreement that we can move forward on, but we're constrained uh, not to meet uh, as a committee during a joint session. Mr. Fowler, you want to respond? Yeah, I recognize uh, the need uh, that Mr. Barber articulated for adequate funding for candidates at the state and local level. I think one of the things we as a national party should do is uh, help build the strength, the viability, both in terms of organization and fundraising of local parties. And I think that we can best contribute to the uh, funding, uh, adequate funding of candidates for governor, the legislature, and similar offices by building the strength of the, uh, of the state and local parties as opposed to providing direct financial subsidy, although we do that now to some extent. Yeah, in looking at the revenues from the Congressional uh, Research Service, the state and local uh, support structure from the Democratic National uh, party in 1994 was uh, 40 million and the Republican was 57 million in 1994. So both of you do involve yourselves extensively in the state and local structure. Uh, without that money, I wonder what some states, now California with its resources could do a bit better job, but I wonder what some states would do if they didn't have that kind of national support. Gentleman from California. Well, Mr. Chairman, we, we really don't have a lot of time to pursue anything, but I, I did want to toss out a couple of thoughts. And, and get whatever brief comments we could receive. Do you think it would be important to change the limits that individuals and PACs now have as it relates to the party giving and individual giving so that there might be some separation? In other words, allowing people who can give only 25000 a year to give more to the parties without it reducing what they might give to individuals? Yes. What do you think about that, Don? I would uh, fix a relatively modest limit on that, uh, Mr. Fazio, although I think that they should be permitted to give more to parties than to individuals. Uh, I suggested $25,000 limit earlier. I think that's reasonable. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's not magic, but that's a good starting point. As, as you both indicated, in, if we just deal with inflation, we'd be moving up. But we do have that overall limit that might, in effect, cause even more conflict between party giving and individual giving, which I know, having chaired one of the campaign committees, is often a point of contention. Um, the other question, and just again has to be brief, if we were to increase the amount of money that could flow into uh, party coffers, and I would believe you would probably both agree, increase the amount that parties could give to candidates over the current aggregate $60,000 or so limit. Would you be willing to agree to a law that would limit what parties could do to pass money on to other entities? And I, I, I think of one, for example, uh, that the Senate uh, campaign committee was reported to have sent money on to pro-life forces in Oregon to, you know, further GOTV activity or whatever. In other words, we need to get into this subject Haley's touched on it, the, the other kinds of money that is impacting campaigns that isn't within federal limits, but in the atmosphere of a campaign has an impact, soft money often. Both parties are involved with allies that do this sort of thing. Would you, however, ostensibly limit or eliminate the party's ability 
to pass money on to other entities that could participate indirectly in federal campaigns? I, I would tread very warily. Uh, I, I do think there is a constitutionally protected right of free speech and issue advocacy, the Supreme Court has ruled that that is free speech that is unlimitable. It's not, it's not an election. But clearly, Congressman, we are getting into a period where a lot of money is spent under that decision that really does affect elections by design. Now, I'm not smart enough to know where the line is, but you know, we all know very well that line is crossed often, and you get into the problem of not reported soft money, non-federal money like Don and I deal with. We report every dime. You've got millions out there being spent. Nobody knows where the money came from. Nobody knows who spent it. But there's millions being spent that's totally undisclosed. So as you're right, it's a subject for another day. But I would tread warily about taking away from an association of people the right to give money to, to somebody else. It's the disclosure that I think is so important. Uh, Mr. Fraser, I think the parties should not have any limit on what they can contribute to candidates of their party. Uh, I, that, that kind of limitation has always been an anomaly to me. I just don't understand the philosophy or theory or what's, what is behind, I mean, what rationale is behind it. So I, I, I think the cap should come off of that. Um, I do think that uh, political parties should have, um, I don't know, I, I can't spell out for you now how it should be limited, but I think there should be limitations on how much the Democratic National Committee or the, the Louisiana Democratic Party can give to another entity that, it, that obviously has a stake in uh, a, a, an, a, a campaign or an election. Uh, that gets into a gray area where I think party responsibility gets diluted or can get diluted. Uh, if you permit it at all, I would certainly want it uh, very carefully bound up with disclosure uh, to purpose and organization. I have a real apprehension about uh, uh, having a party give to some other entity that has a responsibility or an interest in the election. But if you permit it, it certainly should be uh, surrounded by very, very careful disclosure requirements. Would it be rude just to make a comment? You know what, for, what drives party committees to do what you're talking about is spending limits. Right. Spending yeah, limits yeah, is yeah. making everybody hire right. a bunch of lawyers to figure out how to get around them. Exactly. And, and so if you're going to take the top off or move it up, you ought to give up the other possibility that currently is a way of obviating the law. That's exactly that's, right. But that, the limits, Don said the party shouldn't be limited. I agree the party shouldn't be limited because the limitation simply makes everybody spend a bunch of money and time figuring out how to get around the limits. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of the uh, party chairs for their willingness. I know you have very busy schedules. The committee will stand in recess until 12 noon when we'll begin the second panel. On the next book notes, Evan Thomas. He says he's the first outsider journalist or historian ever permitted to read the CIA's secret histories. The CIA was sort of fumbling around trying to figure out what to do after the Cold War ended. They're exempt. The operations directorate, the clandestine service, is exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. They don't have to tell you anything. But uh, Congress was putting some pressure on them to open up. And so uh, they decided three or four years ago to use me as a kind of guinea pig and allow me in to see some things. I by no means saw everything. What I saw were their own secret histories. The CIA has a whole history staff and they write secret histories that nobody can read because they're classified. It's kind of like librarians who love books so much they don't want anybody to read them. Uh, but I was allowed to read these histories which are interesting but it's important to note they are incomplete, they're turgid, they're written by intelligence officers, not professional historians. Uh, they don't promise to be complete records. They are very interesting windows into the way the CIA viewed itself at the time. Newsweek's Evan Thomas and the very best men, Four Who Dared, the early years of the CIA, on Book Notes, Sunday night at 8, Eastern and Pacific Time.
C-SPAN, a public service created by America's cable television companies. Here's what's ahead tonight on C-SPAN. Next, the last part of a hearing on campaign finance reform. Then a Pentagon briefing on so-called hate crimes in the U.S. Army. After that, bipartisan senators on Bosnia, and that's followed by Senate Republican leader Dole on Bosnia and the budget. Now the final portion of this hearing on campaign finance reform. The House Oversight Committee continues its look at the role of political parties in federal elections. will reconvene. Uh, panel two consists of uh, a number of members representing diverse interests, but all of them are unified by the fact that they advocate from a university base. And uh, a number of your friends in our continued effort in trying to get people to understand the role and the importance of political parties. So it's a pleasure to have you. Uh, all of you uh, that have written testimony it will be made a part of the record and you may address us as uh, you see fit uh, to inform us about your particular perspective based upon your knowledge and understanding. Uh, the panel I think is an especially rich one uh, with uh, Dr. Malbin from SUNY State University of New York, uh, Dr. Pomper who has been involved with the Committee for Party Renewal and who I know from his ongoing work at Rutgers University. Uh, Dr. This has you folks switched, Dr. Eichley. You're next uh, as a senior fellow at Georgetown. And then uh, Paul Hernson, uh, who is at the University of Maryland. Why don't we just take you in the order that I announced, uh, and uh, you may proceed, uh, Professor Malvin. Once again, I would encourage you to speak directly into the microphones, because they are very unidirectional. Sure. Um, Mr. Thomas and Mr. Fazio, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my testimony, which I am going to summarize, is uh, in two major parts. The first will be, be about spending by the parties, and the second is about contributions to them. The role of political parties in a democratic republic largely depends on two things. First, on whether the party controls resources which are, that are important to politicians. And second, whether party labels structure the choices for voters. Historically, those two sides uh, usually go together. But uh, for the past 15 years, this country has been going through the strange experience of seeing party organizations become stronger in some respects at the same time as the importance of parties to voters is down and the voters' respect for parties is low. I would argue that the recent strength of parties as organizations has to do with their spending and the issue of respect has at least partly to do with contributions. There's nothing you can do through FECA amendments that would bring b back to the United States a disciplined party system, nor should that be your goal. More realistically, the laws regulating parties can do two things, one negative and one positive. First, on the negative side, poorly thought out laws can do a lot of harms, as you pointed out earlier, by putting major barriers in the way of political parties. And the 74 amendments did that, as you said, by, by treating the parties as if they were interest groups, and that's in turn stifled party activity in 76. The law was corrected somewhat for presidential campaigns uh, uh, after that, but not for congressional. So your first aim should be to follow the Hippocratic Oath, at least do no harm. Second, on a more positive side, the campaign laws can give a modest help to the parties, not fundamentally changing the system, but at least recognizing where the parties fit in. The current laws do that uh, by letting, some, again to somewhat, by letting parties put uh, money into coordinated spending. I would at least raise those uh, coordinated spending limits and also add an uh, automatic inflation adjustment for the direct party contribution limit to candidates or, as was discussed earlier, perhaps raising that quite a bit more. Parties should be able to give more to candidates than a group of PACs in an, in an industry without going through back doors. They should be able to give a lot more. Another change I would recommend would be to reduce the congressional franc uh, so that you would have the money to pay for voter information pamphlets that would replace some of the current government-subsidized financing for incumbents, 
with something that works well in localities to help make elections more competitive. And what makes that relevant for today's uh, panel is that it would be worth leaving room in those pamphlets for party statements as well as ones uh, by the candidates. Finally, I turn to the subject of contributions. Even though I think parties should be able to spend much more to help candidates, I think this has to be coupled with stronger contribution regulations. The country supports campaign finance regulation today largely because it's suspicious about the relationship between large donors and public officials. This suspicion is often too cynical, but we know there is a real issue. The problem is not with interest groups seeking to corrupt public officials with $5,000 contributions. The danger often flows in the other direction. If we think back to 72 before the contribution limits were passed, the committee to re-elect President Nixon raised more than 30 contributions of $100,000 or more that year. Many of it came after, the fund, after fundraisers not very subtly told uh, corporate and trade association officers that it would be in their interest to support the incumbent president. Now, 20 years after Watergate, unregulated soft money has a danger of turning the national party organizations into the next generation's creeps. In 1992, there were about, or as many, $100,000 plus contributions as there were under Nixon. To get control on, on, over this, you should bring soft money that involves a national purpose, uh, if it involves a national purpose, bring them under federal contribution limits. Now, you may want to increase the contribution limits substantially. Uh, we're only, the only concern really is for very large ones, and you may want to index them. Uh, but the point is to have some kind of a limit and to count all federally related money under it. And I emphasize federally related, and I think those can be, that can be distinguished from the state and local that was discussed earlier. One objection might come from some who believe that disclosure should be enough. Let the voters decide. There's a fallacy behind that argument. For disclosure to make a difference, the voters have to receive timely and relevant information. And the voters have to be willing to act on that information in an election. Those assumptions break down when the money flows late or when the recipient is anybody other than the candidate. Once you start passing money through organizations, the responsibility chain becomes too long for the voters. It is absurd to expect the voters' judgment of a candidate to be based on who gave money to a party three or four transactions before it shows up in a district. In any case, the real problem is not at the local level. That's why soft money spending is not a problem. The problem is the relationship between givers and, and people who raise money at the national level. And that's why the way to get at it is with the contribution limits. One final word. The 1996 election may well be a test of two distinct visions of the role of government. I believe both parties should look forward to that election. They are, should be looking forward to try to win a mandate for its goals. But the only way an election can produce a broad mandate is with a strong and respected party system. To nurture and preserve respect for that system, I believe it is crucial to let the parties do what they do well, but also to do away with the image of parties as laundering machines. For parties to play the role that they can and ought to play, they first ought to shed this role that is unworthy of them. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Madam. Dr. Pomper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fazio, it seems to me there are only a few sources, possible sources of campaign money. It can come from individual candidates, but then we restrict offices to the wealthy. It can come from individuals and group contributors such as PACs, but then we open legislators to the unfair influence of special in, uh, interest and to the voters' suspicions. It can come from government, but public financing, it seems to me, is politically impossible. Or it can come from political parties. And what I urge you to do is to write legislation which will increase the party's role in financing elections. I do so because, like most political scientists, I think parties are vital instruments for democracy. And let me just quickly mention some of the things that parties do for effective democracy. They promote agreement between different interests and groups. They promote discussion of major issues and educate the electorate. They promote effective government across all the divisions of the American system. They provide responsibility and accountability. They promote participation. And perhaps most relevant, they promote clean politics. Most politicians, I believe, are honest. But most are distracted. Many appear influenced. And some may even be corrupted by the demands of fundraising. Parties are too large and too diverse to be controlled by any special interest. The old rule of sanitary engineers applies here. The solution to pollution is dilution. 
The current campaign finance law has many defects, many of them stemming from the undermining of parties. The law encourages candidates to run campaigns with little concern for their party and its programs, and thus discourages responsibility and accountability. It gives an advantage to candidates with personal wealth and promotes an endless search for contributions, often from special interests. It helps incumbents who have ready access to individual contributors and PACs, but limits the effective contribution that is the foundation of voter control over government. It allows unlimited independent expenditures by groups with a narrow agenda, while restricting spending from the most broadly based organizations, the political parties. And finally, it stimulates the worst political habits, the search for loopholes in the law, such as soft money, leading to further public cynicism about politicians and withdrawal from the electoral process. Campaign finance reform can remedy the defects of present laws by enhancing the positive role of parties. For many years, I was co-chair with Representative Thomas of the Committee for Party Renewal a group of some 500 political practitioners and academicians interested in revitalizing American political parties. And my suggestions today are drawn from many of the recommendations of that group. In particular, there are five things I would hope you would do. One, parties should be unrestricted in their contributions to candidates if these contributions are reported fully and in a timely manner. There is no plausible reason for limiting a party's contributions to its own candidates. Parties cannot corrupt a candidate. They share a common, valid purpose, winning the election and promoting a policy agenda. Unrestricted party contributions to candidates would also help to recruit more diverse and stronger candidates, particularly challenges. Two, contributions to parties should be permitted in greater amounts than now and should be given preferential treatment in the law. Obviously, those limits should be raised substantially and indexed. Uh, but beyond that, we should recognize that parties, of course, will listen to their contributors in the same way candidates do, but parties have so many contributors that we have to worry much less about undue influence. Three, special contributions, so-called soft money for party development, should be allowed but regulated. These contributions have become critical means to strengthen the institutional capacity of parties. Rather than being maligned as seemingly corrupt soft money, these contributions would better be called party money. Now, there are some problems, but I think they can be remedied. One remedy would be to be a cap on individual contribution, even in soft money, perhaps as high as $100,000. Large as this amount may seem, any such contribution would still be less than a tenth of 1% of the National Committee's budget. Corruption of the parties is hardly likely, at least at that price. Four, increase the financial participation in the parties. The appealing aspect of parties is that they are broad-based membership organizations. This, we can increase this participation in one direction by Chairman Thomas's proposal to require that a large proportion of campaign funds come from the local district or state. To encourage party building, however, I believe that parties should be permitted to match or add to these local funds. There are other possibilities of using the income tax system, credits, deductions, and add-ons. And finally, lowering the cost of campaigning by providing lower mailing rates to candidates, uh, providing for low television rates, uh, and the like can still give us effective campaigns in a way that spending limits, I think, never can and without providing the advantage for incumbents that spending caps inevitably do. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, you are the leading politicians in the United States. You know the public distrust your difficult and honorable profession. Making the parties more significant in campaign reform can meet that distrust, improve the campaign process, and allow you to go on with meeting the great problems facing the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. Uh, Dr. Rackley. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I would like to uh, take my time uh, simply to uh, uh, lay a foundation reminding us of the, uh, the need and the role for parties uh, in the United States, be because this is a, a question, I think, with much of the uh, 
the public. There is a sense that the, uh, the parties uh, may once have played a, a role, uh, but uh, now have be become uh, antiquated and uh, that uh, the parties come to Washington, fight with each other, and really uh, become part of the problem instead of part of the uh, solution. Uh, the founding fathers of the United States, without exception, disliked political parties and believed they had designed a system that would discourage parties from developing. But by the end of George Washington's first term, parties had taken shape in Congress, and in the third presidential election in 1796, candidates ran with the backing of parties. Since that time, parties have played a major, and I think indispensable, role in our governmental system. Unfortunately, some of the founders' initial prejudice against parties has lingered among some journalistic and scholarly commentators and in parts of the general public. Parties perform many valuable functions in American democracy. Among these, uh, some of my colleagues have mentioned uh, uh, some, and I'm sure Paul will mention others. I would uh, uh, refer to the role that uh, parties play in providing leverage for ordinary citizens, which the chairman uh, spoke of this morning, to uh, uh, influence government. Uh, parties give political leaders uh, bases in which to build support for their uh, programs. Uh, parties keep each other honest. It's each party has a political interest in exposing corruption, deception, abuses of authority by its opposition. The parties perform many of the necessary chores of democracy, such as getting voters registered into the polls, disseminating information, and organizing public meetings. Uh, I would like to spend the, uh, the rest of my, my time, however, emphasizing a role of parties which is less often uh, uh, mentioned and is sometimes uh, even denied. Uh, it is often said by scholars and others that ideology plays little part in American politics. It is true that at least until very recently, ideology has been less important in our politics than in the politics of most European countries. Parties of the extreme right or left have never attracted much following in the United States. I would argue, however, that from the very beginning of American democracy, there have been two strains of ideology that have been in useful tension with each other. Very broadly speaking, one of these has ec emphasized economic individualism and social order, while the other has emphasized use of government to promote economic and social equality. We usually call the first of these conservative and the second liberal. Of course, conservatives broadly support equality before the law and equality of opportunity, and liberals value order and economic freedom. <coughs> But there has been a difference in emphasis, and American uh, democracy has been usefully served by their pulling against each other and correcting each other. These two ideological strains have usually been embodied by the two major parties, one I think founded by Alexander Hamilton at the very beginning of our country, the other by Thomas Jefferson. Since the Civil War, they have usually been represented by the Republican Party as the more conservative party, the Democratic Party as the more liberal. Beside their other important functions, the parties have usefully given the voters a choice between the two directions. Voters have used one to balance the other and have sometimes installed the one as the majority party when its direction best meets the, need, the needs of the time. Uh, the uh, parties, uh, you have mentioned, uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, change in role of parties uh, because of the campaign uh, finance situation. That has certainly been uh, uh, important, but I think that today we have uh, stronger parties at the national level uh, than ever uh, in our history. What has really decayed are parties at the state and local uh, levels. And the, uh, the reason uh, for this dis decay is primarily the collapse of the patronage system, which, which not in California or in the far west uh, since the progressive era, but in, in my state of Pennsylvania, other states of the northeast, Great Lakes states, the states of the south, the state and local parties historically were based on patronage. That is, is practically dried up. It's created an entirely new situation. Ideology now plays more of a role in, uh, uh, in, in, in recruiting uh, party supporters, party uh, workers. This has some downside. I think it will continue uh, in the future. Uh, some of our minor parties have been narrowly ideological or have been one-issue parties. But in a country as large and varied as the United States, Major parties have necessarily been coalitions, thereby maintaining continuity, but at the same time offering choice. So our two-party system, and I, I, th I think myself that it is important that it remain a two-party system, uh, has provided us with a means for making broad choices in political direction, while at the same time avoiding political extremes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um.
Dr. Hernson? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I appreciate your invitation to discuss the roles of political parties in American politics. We can best understand the roles that political parties play in contemporary elections by looking at the historical record. During the post-Civil War era into the 1940s, political parties were the central actors in elections. Most parts of, in most parts of the country, local party organizations, often referred to as old-fashioned political machines, recruited and selected candidates for public office and carried out their campaigns. Uh, party organizations were able to dominate the electoral process because they had the power to dispense nominations, possessed a virtual monopoly over the tools of campaigning, and provided the symbolic cues that informed and activated most voters. The golden age of political parties ended because of the introduction of the direct primary, civil service reforms, campaign finance reform, and broader cultural transformations. Modern polling and marketing techniques and the emergence of a core of professional campaign consultants also contributed to the decline of parties by making it possible for candidates to appeal directly to an increasingly independent electorate. Collectively, these changes ushered in an era of candidate-centered elections. Political parties were initially unable to make the transition to the candidate-centered system. Congressional candidates became largely self-starters rather than party recruits. Uh, they received little financial, strategic, or technical help from party committees, turning instead to political action committees and individuals for money and to professional consultants for political expertise. The contemporary era of party politics, which began around the mid-1980s, is marked by the partial adaptation of party organizations to the candidate-centered system. Most of this change took place at the national level, as the party's national, congressional, and senatorial campaign committees began to assemble some of the financial, technical, and organizational resources needed to play a role in modern elections. The importance of parties in the new campaign environment depends not on their ability to dominate elections, rather but on their ability to help candidates and their organizations wage campaigns. In 1994, party organizations contrib contributed roughly $21 million in contributions and coordinated expenditures to House candidates. This figure, which excludes soft money expenditures, comprises approximately 6% of all of the resources assembled by House candidates. Party money accounts for roughly 10% of the resources raised by House challengers. And some others by providing them with services in campaign management, fundraising, issue and opposition research, advertising, and other areas of campaigning that require technical expertise or in-depth research. These organizations also help selected candidates obtain money and other resources from PACs, political consultants, and congressional incumbents. Studies I conducted of the 1984 and 1992 congressional elections demonstrate that candidates in close elections, particularly House challenger and open seat candidates, regard the congressional campaign committees as more helpful in most areas of campaigns, campaigning than our state and local parties, PACs, and other interest groups. By acting as appendages and accessories to campaign organizations fielded by congressional candidates, and by working as intermediaries between candidate organizations, political consultants, and PACs, the congressional campaign committees have become important players in elections. Their role in House campaigns is particularly important, excuse me, House challenger campaigns is particularly important because few PACs or individuals are apt to make large contributions to these, can to these candidates. The things that party organizations are now doing to help candidates, mobilize voters, and present opposing messages directly to the general public are consistent with what scholars have been urging parties to do for years. The party should be encouraged to put even greater effort into these activities. It is unlikely that, the, that parties in the United States can be restored to the level of influence that they enjoyed during the golden age of parties. Uh, there are many here, practitioners and political scientists, that would not, uh, agree, would not wish a return to that age. Nevertheless, the parties can and should be strengthened so they can promote more participatory and competitive elections, encourage greater political accountability, and help reinvigorate American democracies. Parties can be strengthened through measures that enable them to be more helpful to candidates and have a more visible role in politics. Helpfulness means more than serving as a conduit through which campaign contributions flow. Uh, such measures that could help parties include increasing the level of campaign services, whether they be distributed as in-kind contributions or coordinated expenditures that parties can give to candidates, raising the ceilings for annual contributions from individuals and PACs to party committees, furnishing party committees with communication resources, such as free postage, television, and radio time during elections, and post-election policy debates. 
a bold and unconventional approach that would emulate a few states and most industrialized Western democracies is direct, to directly subsidize parties. An alternative to, to subsidies is a system of graduated tax credits for individuals who contribute to parties. These proposals would strengthen parties and increase their roles in elections. They could be used to reduce the party's dependency on soft money. Uh, thank you. Invite your questions. I want to thank all of you, um, not just for your uh, statements that you've made uh, in front of us verbally, but for your um, written testimony. Uh, I think most everyone agrees you can't go home again, and uh, the political parties that I think most of us uh, focus on as that golden age, principally uh, post-World War II and then prior to the changes, but what's occurred to parties in that period has occurred to a number of social institutions impacted in large part by uh, similar societal-wide uh, technological uh, innovations. Uh, but many of these other institutions weren't forcibly required to play a role by a government dictate uh, different than perhaps they otherwise would have played by virtue of the campaign finance changes. So some of my questions um, would go uh, very briefly in the direction of notwithstanding uh, the changed world, to what extent do all of us agree, although I think stated somewhat generally, I want to make sure we get them specifically. And I guess, Jerry, you ticked off a number of them, uh, uh, just itemizing them so I can use your list uh, uh, as much as, uh, uh, as any others. Is there general agreement among you and among your colleagues, perhaps if you can speak larger, about the idea of not having limits on parties' participation in campaigns? limited only by the amounts of money that might be available to them. I was drawn somewhat to the statements of the two party leaders that seemed to support moving in the direction of uh, actually letting parties support uh, their candidates based upon what they thought was an appropriate amount uh, in appropriate elections. Uh, let them make the decision. Any reaction? I think that, uh, that reporting... Jim, would you use the, the microphone? Again, it's very difficult. I, I, I think that, that reporting of contributions, as uh, I think both uh, chairs this morning mentioned, Mr. Chairman, is the, uh, the key to it. As long as we have full reporting of where the, uh, the money is coming from, uh, I would uh, be in favor of uh, virtually no limitation on uh, what can be given to parties. Perhaps it's at some point that that can be uh, abused, but I think that it is so important to provide the parties with the resources that they, uh, they need that it, uh, as long as we know fully and the public knows where the money comes from, I think that we could go a very long way. And what about the other side of the coin in terms of political parties' ability to support candidates? Limits on the amount that parties could give or relatively uh, much higher limits or no limits at all? I would say at least much higher. I think the only concern uh, that some people would have is the party becoming no more than a pass-through. Uh, if there were unlimited contributions to the parties, to the parties, and then unlimited contributions by the parties, uh, that might be just a fiction. Uh, if it were truly party money rather than pass-through money. Uh, most of us uh, would not have any problems with parties spending uh, money on behalf of their candidates and giving money to their candidates. I would agree with that. I would add that it's important to note that uh, parties have some advantages in spending money over individual candidates in that they can uh, buy blocks of consultant time, they can give challengers and open seat contestants for the House or the Senate who perhaps are not as experienced as incumbents and do not have access to the resources of incumbents um, a leg up in the election process. And the, uh, one of the critical roles of parties is to promote competitive elections. And, and um, so the emphasis on, on service and assistance more than parties as a uh, pass through for cash is, is an important uh, thing to keep an eye on. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. I wanted, uh, Jerry had, had five um, recommendations, and I think three of them have to go together. Mm -hmm. uh, specifically, very substantial increase in the amount of money parties can give or spend to or spend on candidates, perhaps unrestricting, but that coupled with um, some kind of limit on contributions to the parties, increasing the limit that now exists, and pulling soft money in some way under some kind of a limit on contributions. 
Uh, I, I, my colleague and I are engaged in a study of a number of the state parties, and they really are just pass-throughs in a lot of states, and that, that is a problem. Let me uh, add to the, to the statistic that uh, Paul, Paul Hernson gave you. 10% of challenger money comes from parties. 20% of challenger money in the House comes from self. Uh, self-loan or contribution. That's an awful lot. It says to me that there might be more viable challenges out there if parties had, had uh, freer restrictions. Well, uh, in reference to the pass-through, and I think all of us are uh, concerned about uh, parties simply turning into uh, revolving doors for money, but what has struck me over the years are the number of quote-unquote reformers who have offered offsets or various uh, ways to fund uh, offsets in campaigns, many of them coming from the U.S. Treasury. For example, what do you do with, uh, I'm almost tempted to ask you whether you believe there is a constitutional ability for an individual to spend their own money unlimited, or should we test it? But wouldn't parties be uh, an appropriate offset for that if they were willing to spend the money? There's a lot of comment about incumbents' ability to carry over campaign war chests and that there are large amounts of money. Wouldn't parties be an appropriate vehicle to offset uh, the campaign war chest? Um, that wouldn't be a pass-through. That would be a party decision as to where it placed its resources, where it thought it could get the best return in whatever form it thought was appropriate to assist candidates. But that parties could be, I think, the answer, if they had greater resources available to them, to, to provide that offset to the individual's ability to spend in campaigns, which I think is in part distorted the uh, uh, the landscape. I don't think the. I don't. I don't think the, the. The. It's a little more comp. You make it. It sounds a little more complicated the way you're putting it now. If you simply lift the limits on parties, you don't have to worry about whether they spend it against whether it goes against a rich candidate or it goes against. What, just just lift it and and then. Well, don't the reason I emphasize more. that, Mike, was that that if you lift it, uh, people then say it's a simply a pass through. No, no, what I was pointing out were the kinds of decisions that a party would would make as to where it put the money based upon what was going on in a particular campaign. No, that problem comes from the contribution. It doesn't come where the party spends the money. It comes where does the party get the money. One thing about the uh, spending, we, we shouldn't just think that all campaigns are 435 separate campaigns for the House. Uh, Paul's point is important. There are economies of scale, if you will, that a party can uh, realize that candidates can. Uh, a party can do national polling even as it does individual uh, district polling and find out the themes that are important to the public. It can do generic uh, advertising. Uh, it obviously can do research and policy development, all of which uh, would help individual candidates but would not be allocatable or should not be allocated to any specific candidate. The, uh, the pass-through uh problem, Mr. Chairman, I think could be uh, dealt with uh, through an avenue that we haven't mentioned yet, uh, which is uh, provision of, of services, particularly uh, free television time. As you know, the major source of the rising cost of campaigns has been television uh, advertising. And it would seem to me that if the parties uh, were allocated uh, television time, that they could then distribute to their candidates, uh, placing the, the resources uh, where they think it is uh, most needed, that it would greatly strengthen the, uh, the role of the parties and take some of this pressure uh, out of campaigns that we now get from cost of television advertising. One of the uh, ways to prevent party money given to candidates uh, or party help given to candidates from becoming a direct pass-through is to, rather than increase the contribution limits, increase um, coordinated spending limits in which both parties and candidates have a, a say in how the money is spent um, and where the campaign services are purchased from. Uh, Jim Reikley's point about uh, parties and, and media are a very important point. Just as members of Congress have a franked mail, uh, it may be a worthwhile reform uh, to give parties some kind of franked mail, uh, some kind of access to television, and some kind of uh, access to uh, radio. It's very uncommon for us in this country to think of parties as deserving of that, but in most Western democracies, parties do receive those sorts of resources as well as some form of direct subsidy from the government. Uh, just let me say briefly, although TV obviously is a major impactor, uh, especially on national campaigns and some statewide campaigns, for many members uh, campaigning uh, for Congress, Paul, your point about the mail is frankly the primary uh, source of expenditure. There are some areas in which TV is cheap enough 
uh, to be able to use to have some impact. But for many, many folk, uh, it's the mail. And then just finally, uh, Dr. Eichley, it's true that the, the parties could be seen to a certain extent in an ideological uh, framework, uh, debating the role of government in the society, or the way I sometimes like to put it, the freedom to versus the freedom from. Uh, the role of government are interacting with individuals to make decisions for themselves or the collective assisting them freedom to freedom from but notwithstanding that um, If that's the position of the candidates and the issues of the party as they formulate a party platform Around that approach to the role of government in the society the party still have to do the basic stuff Which is to go out which makes them unique recruit the candidates get those candidates elected program that public policy and educate folk. And I think the point made by the party chairman earlier is um, uh, an important one, and that is that the parties are taking on more and more a role of educating folk about the party positions, uh, because PACs certainly spend a lot of money but are not interested in those broader-based educational roles, and the only other source available uh, is the media. And so perhaps we need to look at political parties uh, as an informational base uh, more than we have in the past, and I hadn't really focused on that. Uh, but regardless of what that information is that they're advocating or trying to educate, they've still got those basic jobs uh, to do regardless of what is being transmitted. Uh, well, I want to think. I think that's very true, uh, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, and I, I think that one of, the, uh, one of the other big changes that has occurred in our whole society is the uh, the disappearance largely disappearance of the partisan press the uh, uh, newspapers used to take one side or the other uh, they don't so much anymore they're, they're against everybody they play an adversarial uh, role and the parties themselves I think have got to come in to fill more of that role as you say in providing information and, uh, and a, a, the direction of, of policy and to a certain extent, the old volunteer party structure simply isn't there. One, there's no reward uh, structure at the local level to involve folk, uh, and it's just more difficult to, to get people to participate in the way that they used to. Very much so. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Jerry, comment? Uh, no, just that uh, you mentioned the media. The media try to uh, inform voters, or they say they do. Uh, but the media also, we have some scholarly studies on this, have tended to disregard candidates uh, and representatives, parties, completely. And it seems to me they confuse the public by that disregard. Now, the parties obviously have an interest in uh, getting that identification across. But what we need to do is back up that party interest with some financial yeah. ability to bring that message across and to help their candidates. But what bothers me a little bit is that many of the, re much of the reporting, I should say, it seems to be uh, to inflame rather than to inform so that there could be um, a, a good fight or at least characterized as a fight so that they can then report on who's winning or who's losing rather than uh, the difference between the public policy's position that there is no right or wrong, they're competing rights and they seem to have a difficult time doing that, especially in the way in which the national media promotes any issue uh, that's before the Congress. A gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's been a very interesting panel, and I'm, I'm impressed with the degree that there seems to be consensus within the academic community, and I'd be interested in your thoughts as to whether uh, it may have been a process of this committee's selection or whether you think that uh, others in your profession uh, would agree with you. Uh, in, your, uh, in your response to questions, I hope you'll be able to inject your, your feelings about how the academic community, political scientists, in general are viewing this because it seems to me that there has been a dissing of the, pu of the political parties by most of the would-be reformers who are proposing every two years a new and still better solution to the existing problems. But it also seems to me that incumbent office holders have found it much to their advantage over time to loosen the bounds of parties in order to perpetuate their incumbency, knowing that it's a lot easier to ride out the political winds that blow back and forth when you can stand apart from or be above, as we would have it, the, the kind of partisan give and take, hence people running localized campaigns versus national elections, which uh, uh, may or may not be a factor in the change in what happened in this last election cycle here in the House of Representatives. But I, I think uh, 
there are lots of practical problems we've got to look at. And uh, I'm particularly anxious to hear more about how you would deal with the question of soft money at the state and local level. Because as you've said, the parties are to some extent suffering dry rot at that level. And so they become pass through entities for candidates for federal office, thereby getting around the limits that we have so carefully imposed. Uh, how do we regulate both individual and corporate giving? How do we do it in the context of, as Haley Barber was saying earlier, a general point of view that says we shouldn't be involved in the way state and local campaigns are financed and run? Because, you know, that means in some states the opportunity for this is greater than others. And let me ask a specific question that relates to this that comes out of the recent reform movement. What role should candidates have in the fundraising for parties? I've done that directly for four years, just finished in the last two cycles. But much of what I've heard from reformers is to remove the incumbent politicians from the process of raising money for the party, certainly soft money, certainly for state and local. And I'm sure there are those who would like to remove us from the process of raising it for the national parties. I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on some of those assertions and questions. In, in response to your first question, uh, Mr. Fazio, uh, I would say there is broad consensus within the uh, profession on the desirability of strengthening parties, that the, that the parties have been, uh, uh, been weakened in the overall uh, system. There is some disagreement within the profession on whether a two-party system <coughs> is, is desirable. There are, are some political scientists who feel we're better off with more of a multi-party system. I myself don't think that. I, I think that the, the two-party system works very well uh, in a country particularly of this, uh, this size, that uh, if we went off into many parties as they have in, in some of the European countries, uh, that it would uh, undermine the entire uh, process, it would fragment our society uh, in a way that would, uh, would not be uh, uh, constructive. So I think that the, uh, the two-party system has been uh, uh, an essential part of providing us with broad choices, but at the same time with maintaining a certain continuity. Uh, with the the, the two-party system does discourage extremes, uh, and I think myself that that's a, a good thing, but there are others who would disagree on that. Uh, Mr. Fidio, I think there are some academic, and I mean this in the bad sense, uh, <laughs> arguments about uh, a disciplined, responsible party system. We're not talking about that. The you know, United States is not going to have that kind of system. I think there is broad consensus in the uh, discipline about the need for strengthening parties and the desirability of, of more party uh, finance in the campaign process. But le let me also say that sometimes it gets very discouraging because what political scientists believe often has nothing to do with what the public uh, believes. Uh, let me give you just one example. Uh, it is widespread uh, conventional wisdom within political science the most important thing in campaigns, in making campaigns competitive, is the amount of money the challenger has. Uh, and so that spending caps, when they're low, are really detrimental to effective competition. Contrast that to the most common reform that is promoted before you, which is severe and low spending caps. And there's just a disjuncture between what political scientists think they know and what reformers, in quotations, are often presenting to you. Mm -hmm. I, I would address the uh, soft money issue and the candidate fundraising uh, for parties issue. Um, in terms of soft money, I believe there's a consensus among political scientists. We like what it's spent on. We like uh, party building at the state and local level. We like get out the vote drives, voter mobilization drives. There may be some disagreement about uh, where it comes from. I believe uh, I, for one, am not in favor of large corporate contributions being raised in the nation's capital and then shuttled all over the country. Uh, to voter mobilization activities that sometimes bypass the traditional party organizations. In terms of candidate fundraising for parties, um, when it's soft money, people disagree. When it's, it's hard money and when members of Congress host fundraisers for challengers or even give contributions out of their own campaign chests to challengers um, who are in what are expected to be marginal seats, um, I believe there's probably support among political scientists for this. Um, I just recently did some statistical analysis and found that um, incumbents gave roughly uh, $2 million out of their own campaign coffers to uh, 
uh, open seat and challenger candidates in 1994, and there was almost an equal sum uh, spent by uh, incumbent uh, member political action committees on behalf of challengers. Uh, the key thing, I believe, is, is to maintain competition, and if parties act as an arena for the redistribution of wealth um, to help challengers, um, no offense, challenge you, incumbents, uh, it's, it's good for democracy. Um, the critical issue, perhaps, is not so much money, but communications, making sure candidates and parties have some sort of communications resources. If we uh, find some way to allocate the public airwaves, to allocate um, the public mail, some of those t uh, resources to candidates, uh, money may become less of an overriding factor in elections. Uh, but that is uh, a fairly large reform to ask any uh, Congress to pass. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Malvin, yeah. You touched on a point that hmm. When you, when you start talking seriously and try to write legislative language, it's going to be very tough. Mm -hmm. uh, but I urge you to try to do so. Um, the national committees, uh, because they are national, because they have an apparatus in place, make it possible uh, to, to provide great benefits to the state and local parties as well as the candidates. They can raise uh, more money than the local committees can do on their own. This should be encouraged. Uh, the, and what we're all suggesting is that you should take some of the lid off. Um, but in return for taking the lid off, there's going to be a lot of suspicion in there. Uh, figure out some way to define what is a national activity and put contribution limits on it. Uh, I would think that you could raise so much money through the National Committee that you could simply say that money that comes through the National Committee is subject to some kind of a national limit. Maybe it's $100,000. If it's 100,000, there's only a total of about 30 contributions uh, that would be affected uh, from the last cycle. That's not a lot of money compared to what you're enabling the parties to do, but it's buying a lot of public trust, and I think it's a, it's a real uh, valuable and fair trade-off. I appreciate your comments. You know, we've gone from the period when reformers were opposed to the parties, or at least tried to change them, and when they failed, took them on as institutions, to now uh, having targeted the PACs as the enemy. And it seems to me it's because wherever money flows, wherever power flows, becomes the enemy of the reformer. Uh, I'm sure we will be accused of, by some of saying, well, let's give it back to the parties and we haven't solved the problem. I think there's general consensus we're not going to have much public financing, although most of you would suggest some indirect subsidy from the public airwaves or the postal service. But we really find ourselves in a position where every time we move toward disclosure, even with limits, we seem to provide more grist for the mill of those who come down against uh, political participation. And uh, the fact that money talks and um, the influence the politician loses credibility, the institutions lose public trust. Just briefly, let, let's all of you blue sky a bit for us. Given the end of patronage, and we're not going back, in fact, the reformers don't even like the repeal of the Hatch Act because it allows public employees to participate, uh, where do you think we could both repair some of the damage at the grassroots, and how could we avoid just shifting the venue of criticism from one institution to another because, in fact, it takes money, and indeed a great deal of money, to make an impact on an already overwhelmed public in terms of advertising and public messages in general. I'd be interested in your, in your comments. And then I'll let my colleagues have questions. Well, uh, in my written statement, I suggest a number of them. Um, uh, obviously, anything you do with the tax law costs money one way or another. Uh, although one method doesn't. Uh, some states use a tax add-on instead of uh, a credit or a deduction, which is a loss of revenue. They allow uh, uh, the taxpayer to add to his or her tax bill, uh, two, three, five dollars. Mr. Uh, Thomas, a member of the Ways and Means Committee, tells me that the tax credit is vastly abused by people who actually don't contribute but always take the credit. The check off. The check off. No, he's talking, I think, more about the old law that would be happy to yield. Never said vastly abused. I just think that when you have a form that says check this and you get a hundred dollars credit, 
uh, the temptation to check it without necessarily carrying out the behavioral relationship is very strong. <laughs> <laughs> very cautious Ways and Means Committee member. I, re I will pull back the word vastly. I think his concerns are evident. Uh, well, the checkoff, of course, doesn't do that. You don't get any uh, money from it. You just divert some money right. from the Federal mm -hmm. Treasury to, uh, to candidates. Uh, the add-on, on the other hand, uh, you have to send in the money. Your, your tax bill is $1,000, and you send in 1005 and the Treasury passes the $5 on. Mm -hmm. um, about half of the states do one or another or some combination of them, um, and it seems to me that's a worthwhile thing. Uh, Low-cost kinds of items that would improve communication uh, and therefore and probably lower the cost of campaigns are things like uh, a free mailing. Oregon does this, Canada does it, Britain does it. It's not terribly expensive when you mail in bulk, and, and this would be bulk, bulk. Uh, but at least we would know that uh, every voter had at least one piece of uh, propaganda uh, campaigning from every major candidate uh, who wants their vote. It seems to me that would be a great contribution in, in the political sense without costing a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would just like to introduce one uh, caution. Uh, in, I, I'm very supportive of the, the work you're doing and what you're considering uh, doing, uh, but I think it's, it's worth making the point uh, that parties have been and still are to a great extent uh, state entities uh, in the United States, and I think that that, that has worked well uh, for us. And uh, so I would uh, share some of the concern that was expressed earlier this morning, uh, that we not, uh, while doing what we can to support parties, that we not extend uh, uh, federal, too much federal regulation. I think parties are already too regulated at the state level, and uh, uh, what we really should be trying to do is to withdraw some of those regulations from the state level, and certainly not to introduce more regulation on a, on a federal basis. Well, I would uh, agree with most of what's been said. The only thing I, I guess I would add would be to return to the notion of uh, communications resources. Uh, again, the mails or the airwaves, whether radio or television, and try to uh, reclaim some of the airwaves and perhaps uh, arrange for the party to allow a spokesperson to uh, make a small presentation, follow, you know, each party, one following the other uh, during election time, uh, and perhaps touting some of their candidates. One of the problems parties have today at the local level is, is recruiting candidates, and part of the reason is uh, they don't have much to offer the candidates. So if uh, parties can at least give some sort of plug to their candidates through uh, communications resources, that would be uh, very helpful, I believe. Mm -hmm. Mr. Fitzgerald, uh, unlike my colleagues, I'm not going to ask uh, Ed additional uh, legislative ideas on the table uh, because I think you have the most important one right in front of you now. Uh, earlier you mentioned uh, that office holders um, like to distance themselves and run personalized campaigns and we all know uh, the, the, the standard number we know from survey research is that party defections in, used to run two to one in favor of an incumbent in congressional elections, that is people voting for someone opposite. Now, in, uh, uh, as recently as say 92 or 90, it was more like 15 to one. Uh, and it was almost all in the direction of the incumbent and we all know why this is so. Um, the, a lot of the feeling that I think people had about Congress came from a feeling that their notions about what what they cared about in national policy and their vote for the member were disconnected. They liked their member, they didn't like Congress, they didn't like the policy. When we, we've been moving in a direction in this last election, and I feel certain that the 96 election, uh, based at least on today's election in California and the kind of campaign that's going on, is going to be a choice about national directions. And when that happens, when the parties are very heavy and prominent in an election, I think that by making sure the parties have the resources to be much more important uh, for candidates, then candidates will find a reason to go to the parties and the voters will have a choice about what the major national issues are. And I think there's nothing more important that you could do and a lot of other stuff is just tinkering. So in other words, we would be moving away from the term limit solution to a more natural process of evolution, turnover being more frequent because party favor would be shifting back and forth. And of course, at least it seems that we've done away with that region of the country that was for the Democrats a one-party region, which of course strengthened its role in the Congress. It may be, and we'll hear soon from Mr. Brady, 
some information about whether people think it's going the other way to a one-party section. But the bottom line is what you're suggesting is that we may move away from more artificial solutions to the, the need for change in the institution if the parties become more a factor in people's judgment as to whether they will participate at all and then how they'll vote. I think the one-party situation in the South that you refer to actually weakened the parties, created an unnatural effect, uh, and the, uh, you simply had factions uh, in the South, and there was no real party structure uh, as such. So I think that that change has really been supportive to uh, a two-party system. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Michigan wish to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it seems to me that uh, all of you are agreed that parties should be strengthened. The fact that the parties have become weaker is not a good thing, and I tend to agree with that. But I'd also lot of, like to follow up on a comment from my colleague from California that uh, reformers tend to be opposed to whoever has the power at the moment. And it seems to me you've painted too rosy a picture of what would happen if the parties once again became dominant. Uh, comments that were made such as parties are trusted, Parties are less c likely to be corrupted than individual politicians. Uh, when I grew up, uh, that's one of the advantages of being old, one of the very few advantages of being old, of course. Uh, you've been through these cycles. When I was a child, the parties were fairly strong, and they were regarded, at least in my community and my household, with great suspicion. They were evil things. The people, the office holders, were the good ones. And uh, candidates were chosen in smoke-filled rooms. They quite often didn't pick the best candidate. They picked someone who would do favors for them, et cetera. Uh, I, I guess I'd like to hear a little from you about why, why you think it's so wonderful to have uh, strong parties and that, in fact, they are better than the office holders, particularly on the issue of corruption, which I think happens to be considerably less now than it was at, at some times in the past. I'd also, uh, while you're addressing that, um, I've heard little discussion of the impact of television or the electronic media in general on this issue, and that's really the source of the campaign financing problem. You cannot get elected today without substantial funds, and that is a dramatic change from 50 years ago or even earlier. The, uh, the, what that has led to is the campaign finance issues, but also an inordinate number of wealthy people being elected. Uh, if you look at the statistics, the number of millionaires who are elected to the House and the Senate, particularly the Senate, it's certainly out of sync with the population as a whole, and the problem's getting worse and worse. Uh, some of you mentioned earlier about parties. One of their primary tasks is to recruit good people to run, and it is very difficult. I'll agree with that. Uh, what I find is a selection factor in many cases, a party uh, other things being equal, will certainly pick the wealthy candidate who promises to pay for 50 percent or 80 percent of the campaign, because that's just a financial burden off the party's back. So I'd, I'd like uh, each of you to, to make some comments on these observations. You know, why are parties, is it really that wonderful to have extremely strong parties who pick the candidates? Um, are they, in fact, more to be trusted than the individual candidates or elected officials? And how does this all relate to the tremendous need for money today and uh, the issue of wealthy candidates? And after, after you have that, I have one more question to, <laughs> to wrap up. Uh, yes. I, 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 too, remember the good old days, uh, which were not so good in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania, uh, among uh, many other uh, uh, states, of, uh, uh, particularly the... Uh, industrial states. And I think there is some danger in, in trying to go back to the old system. There are some who uh, recommend uh, reinducing uh, patronage to, to a much greater extent that is now permitted uh, for the most part by state laws and uh, federal laws as well. I think that would be a bad thing. I think the patronage system, uh, it had some, uh, some merits, but uh, I think it, uh, it undermined uh, trust and uh, confidence uh, in government. I, I think that we have now moved so far in the other direction uh, at the state uh, and local levels, uh, that we uh, the uh, the cause for fear of revival of parties is not uh, the current problem. Uh, I think that, that parties, when they uh, were strong and and uh, where they still are strong, they do offset the the problem which you 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 point to quite correctly. 
of uh, individual wealth playing such an inordinate role in, in politics. Uh, I think that, uh, that parties, when they are strong, uh, do not simply uh, seek uh, wealthy candidates. They seek to reward people who uh, share the party's point of view and who have been active in, uh, in building the, the party. So I, say, I think that uh, strengthening parties uh, would uh, work against that problem. Uh, I don't think the, uh, the point isn't that parties are made up of uh, wonderful people and office holders aren't, because after all, they're the same kinds of people. And, uh, you know, no, I, I beg to differ with that. <laughs> I happen to think office holders are better in general. Well, I think we're talking about politicians, and I regard that as an honorable word <laughs> yeah. in both instances. Uh, and the question, it's not a question of making the parties into old style machines and so on. We could have an academic, you know, abstract discussion about whether that was a good thing or a bad thing, but it's certainly a past thing and it's not going to be revived. Uh, the real question is the balance. And the balance today is toward individually wealthy people, as you've mentioned, and second of all, individual candidates who then come to Congress and normally, and I recognize this is an unusual session of Congress, but are normally going off in a number of directions becomes very difficult for the public to affix responsibility and accountability for the course of public policy. Mm -hmm. Parties, normal kinds of people, but what's particularly, uh, particular about them is that they want to win a majority for all the reasons, policy and others, that people like of political power. In order to do that, they have to come up with some kind of a program, they have to sell it, they have to take responsibility for it, and who do they sell out to? They sell out to majorities, because majorities are the people who give a party and a group of politicians power. Now selling out to majorities, in, in one sense, is the definition of democracy. And if we can make majorities able to really enforce the selling out to them, I think we're promoting the democratic process. And th that's why I think we need stronger parties. Okay. I would um, f follow up by uh, avoiding allusions to age, but pointing out that I, I and several others here were raised in, in areas where there were strong patronage political machines. Uh, I was raised in Nassau County. And um, that party there, the Nassau County machine, was considered uh, corrupt, and, and several of its office holders actually did have to go to, to prison. One of the key things that has changed, though, and one of the good areas of the federal law has to do with disclosure. We now know more about the flow of political money, whether it be party money or candidate money, than uh, we've known uh, since before the passage of the law in the 1970s. And so I, I think that um, the fear of returning to a, a corrupt political machine, so long as this disclosure is uh, continually enforced by the Federal Election Commission, is is, it's an important fear, but probably one that uh, does not have to be weighed as heavily as it did before. Uh, one of the uh, key issues you, you discussed was the cost of TV, the cost of elections, um, uh, things like direct mail. They're all very, very expensive, um, and they have mixed impact on the outcome of, of uh, elections. Um, giving perhaps parties some opportunity to effectively use these resources on behalf of candidates um, might be helpful in offsetting millionaire candidacies by, by having um, someone be able to approach, a party leader approach, an upstanding citizen of the community or another party activist and say, uh, we'd like you to run. We think you can, we can provide you with the following resources. Uh, they could be helpful in getting elected. Uh, they wouldn't be everything, but they would be a good head start. They would be a, sort of a seed from which your campaign could sprout and, and further blossom. Um, in so doing, there would also be some party influence over the content, perhaps, and hopefully of some of the information that flowed um, from the candidate's campaign. And, and what elections are about it, are choice, a uh, choice between uh, two, sometimes uh, three people when we have strong minor party candidates. And it's important, I believe, to have parties be part of that choice between the candidates. Mr. Okay. Um, I. I agree with some of the with the premise of what you what you said. Where you said that you tend to think office holders are better than parties, not because, and I don't agree because they're maybe maybe people. I should say less corruptible. Let, let me let me let me say why. It's, it's the old if men were angels and government wouldn't be necessary. Um, fact is that uh, it's a lot easier to read uh, a, a candidate's statement than it is to read a party's uh, financial statement. Um, 
And so that's, and that's, so in fact, where I come from, New York State, same as where Paul referred to, uh, figuring out what the parties are doing is very, very difficult. Um, the reason for, for wanting to strengthen parties is not because it's easier to look at their records. Because the reason for wanting to strengthen parties has to do with a whole lot of other things relating to accountability, relating to the policy content of elections. And when you do that, it therefore becomes necessary to look at uh, how do you go about dealing with other problems. And I've argued that the, we've, I think, agreed in saying that, that therefore you have to limit contributions in some way or another. Um, you have, there, there has to be at least some kind of an increase limit, but some kind of a limit. There has to be some sort of a federal in, uh, look at um, uh, all of, uh, and, and not just disclosure. Um, but the, let me link this to your other point. Uh, as I said, I think what uh, as I said earlier, 20 percent of challenger money this year came from the candidate to him or herself. Uh, reason. Um, there's only a choice in elections where there are two viable candidates. It costs a lot to be a viable candidate. Uh, um, money is not plentiful. Uh, therefore, by default, uh, you, uh, often the person who comes forward is a person who's willing to bankroll him or herself. The party can be an alternative source of significant amounts of money. In addition, the party can uh, can make a choice into one that more involves national policy issues, therefore a more real choice for the voters. Uh, that, I think, is a major plus to the system. The plus is not that automatically less corruptible. The plus is that this is a major plus for voter connection to the system. It's a major plus for all sorts of reasons. And therefore, in order to get that plus, you, you have to look at what, what an ancillary problem. The problem exists right now, and that is and that is the somehow defining how to regulate soft money. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. And I have one final question, and that relates to, uh, once again, having been through several cycles of the campaign financing. The post-Watergate system, which we are largely under now, was full disclosure of everything, campaign limits, and uh, the, we thought the problem had been solved. This was long before I got here or even got in, involved in politics. Now suddenly uh, the system is under attack again. I, the, the whole purpose of the series of hearings is not just to talk about parties, but to look at the issue of campaign financing and campaign finance reform. There are a number of groups and individuals calling very loudly for reform of our camp method of campaign financing. I would appreciate your opinion as uh, experts in this field. Do you believe that there is a problem with the way campaigns are currently being financed? And if so, uh, what is the problem and what is the solution? And I'm referring primarily to our current system of, of uh, individual campaigns, but if you wish to comment on party finances, I'd, I'd welcome that also. I personally think the main problem one sees in looking at uh, uh, congressional election results is that candidate, uh, con challengers don't have enough money. And therefore, I'd raise the seed money for uh, contribution, lim contribution limits for seed money. I, I, I think a lot of what is touted as a problem, I do not think personally is a problem. Uh, um, I, I, I think spending limits are easily evaded and therefore a bad solution to, a, to I'm not sure what the problem is. Uh, um, uh, so I think, and again, I, I think that the main problem that one sees with uh, interest group involvement is best taken care of, uh, as, some, as Jerry said, through dilution, through increasing the role of parties. Uh, I, I don't think that a common cause style bill, style bill would be good for the country. I don't think the problem is too much money being uh, spent. Uh, I say in my statement that uh, even in uh, 1994, we spent about uh, $5, all the contributions total, it's about $5 per voter. It doesn't seem to me a huge cost for a democratic process. Uh, I think the, pro the problem is inequality of access, particularly challenges as against incumbents, and this may not be the right audience to say this to, uh, but on a theoretical level I think that's the problem and may be a problem from time to time of inequality even of the parties. Uh, I think the problem is getting started. Uh, getting to that point, we don't know what it is, but there's some point uh, where 
to have a minimum kind of campaign, you've got to get to some point. It's certainly in the six figures. Uh, how do you get to that point is, is the crucial uh, thing. Um, and the equality uh, or the, the equality of access, not, it doesn't have to be equality of money, but you, there's a basic message that has to get across. The other problem is uh, the public feeling that some people have an advantage in pressing their case before Congress that has nothing to do with the merits of that case. It's a widespread public perception and although I don't want spending limits and I'm very suspicious of limits even on PACs, I think you have to deal with that perception because the public thinks that contributions mean inequality of access and inequality of influence and, in and unfair results in public policy. If I can just pin you down on that. That is indeed a perception out there. But uh, trying to design a system to take care of perception, perception is very difficult because uh, it'll be replaced by another perception, e equally pernicious, equally wrong. And so my question is, what, what is a solution in a case like that? Well, uh, I tried to illustrate some of the things uh, you know, that I think would help. I think if a campaign, if there were more services available to candidates uh, because they're legitimate, recognized, certified candidates, and they didn't have to do as much independent fundraising, I think that would help. I think if parties did more of the work for them, the cost would be lower, and that would help. Uh, and, you know, solutions along that line. I, I, I think that the, uh, the last problem that you mentioned, the problem of perception of how our system works, is an enormous problem in our, in our whole country, our whole society. Uh, and that goes beyond uh, anything that we're talking about here today. I think that the education problem uh, that we have as, as educators, the, the, the role of the media and so forth, uh, has got to be brought to address that problem. And that, that's a very difficult uh, thing uh, to do. Uh, on, the, on the other question, I, I would uh, share the view of my colleagues that the, uh, the primary problem in the system uh, has been the uh, uh, excessive uh, advantage given to uh, uh, incumbents in, uh, in raising uh, money. Uh, I think, frankly, that, that part of that may have been uh, corrected by the outcome of the election last year, that quite apart from its, uh, its policy effects, uh, that it did uh, create more of a, of a sense of uh, competition between the, the parties. I think that the, uh, there is a, a sense now among those who are able to contribute uh, money that uh, it is worthwhile uh, to give to, uh, uh, to, to either side and that that will uh, build up more of an uh, equality between uh, challengers and uh, uh, incumbents. Uh, finally, I, th I think, as, as I mentioned before and some of the others have mentioned, that if we uh, can uh, give access uh, two parties uh, to television that they could then make available uh, to the candidates running on their uh, line that that would uh, deal with a lot of our problems. I uh, believe I'm another uh, voice joining the chorus. Uh, there is a, a unanimity here in, in the feeling that resources need to be distributed more equally between challengers and incumbents to, to allow for greater electoral competition. Um, I uh, understand uh, the Vice Chairman's hesitance uh, to go ahead in some ways with campaign reform. Uh, there's always operating the law of unintended consequences and, and one of the things that we know now is that greater disclosure um, has probably in some ways driven up pessimism about uh, campaign finance. People now say, oh look, this member of Congress received so and so thousands of dollars from a certain industry, he must be in their pocket. and. Uh, that's an unfortunate bit of rhetoric uh, that's uh, been developed by a lot of the uh, so-called uh, public interest groups. Uh, um, and the unfortunate part of it is, is that uh, very often, or I can't imagine of many times where it would be true, because often the money flows where constitu constituents' interests lie. And, and uh, if disclosure reveals that a member of Congress gets a lot of support from the auto industry, well, maybe there's an automobile plant in the district, and maybe that has something to do with it. Um, I guess uh, uh, my final point would be uh, public opinion will always uh, look upon money in politics with skepticism and uh, that's a problem that we'll have to be lived with. Um, perhaps the, the best uh, way to deal with it is to not consider it and just do what you think is best for the nation. Well, I want to thank you very much for those, uh, those comments. They're very useful to me and to the panel. And Mr. Chairman, if I just may add one comment. Uh, when I talked about individuals versus the parties in terms of corruptibility or incorruptibility, 
I did not mean to put a halo over anyone here. It's just that those of us in the, the public eye, I think, uh, generally recognize much more clearly the need of following the P's and Q's, recognize, and of course, our, not only our jobs, but our reputations are on the line constantly. It means a great deal to us. I find many party volunteers are just uh, either don't know about the niceties of, of the, uh, the laws or are not concerned about them. And perhaps uh, if they were stronger, that would change. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Th thank you, gentlemen. Um, it's interesting that uh, the speaker started off this series of hearings uh, with his presentation in which he advocated, as some of you have, that perhaps there's not enough money in the system, that perhaps we need more. And he made some comparisons. And I think uh, you folks have made somewhat similar observations. Uh, you probably won't get as much national coverage uh, 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 as he did making the same observations. I tell my friend from, from Michigan, however, uh, when we examine the role of political parties in campaign finance reform, I personally believe that parties are part of the solution rather than part of the problem, especially um, in today's world. And that goes for minor parties as well as major parties. As far as the perception is concerned, it's one of the reasons that I've asked people to entertain the idea of a structural reform, which I believe uh, could be constitutional, and that is requiring a majority of funds from individuals in the districts, which would have a way of strengthening parties, uh, interestingly enough, from a grassroots point of view, because I believe that would put a premium on organization, uh, and that parties have always had that organizational aspect uh, to them, and that that might be a way to strengthen us. Finally, Jerry, your observation that selling out to majorities is what democracy is all about. I'm really worried now that we're going to have folks investigating majorities as special interests. Uh, so you're going to sell out to, uh, uh, to majorities. Yeah, that's right. Here's a question, and I'm going to submit it in writing to the national uh, party chairs, and I want your reaction to it, because, Paul, you have repeatedly said uh, more money available for uh, certain activities primarily uh, through the media responses. A point that a lot of people I don't think are aware of is that the parties are currently getting uh, presidential fund monies. Um, and this uh, 96 year will probably produce somewhere between 10 and 15 million dollars provided to both national parties to assist them in funding their national party conventions. Uh, do you folks believe that that's the highest and best use of that presidential fund money, or could it be put to better use? Or does, in fact, the preparation for focus on and presentation of the National Party Convention uh, assist in ways that we're not uh, uh, fully aware of, and that that's uh, a good use of the money? Speaking for the San Francisco Democrats and the Houston Republicans. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking for the San Diego Republicans uh, for 96. It's almost a loaded question, but I did want to bring that point up since there is 25 to $30 million of money that's going to be spent in the 96 cycle out of the presidential fund. Well, national conventions, of course, have become a giant campaign rally uh, for the parties. Uh, they're not decision makers as they were in the supposed good old days. Uh, but they are, we know, the first time in which most of the public begins to get a picture of the national candidates, the presidential candidates and, and the platform that that candidate is pushing. I think that's a vital educational function and a vital part of the voters' decision about who they want to be president and vice president. Um, I think the problem in the conventions, aside from, you know, <laughs> they go on too long, perhaps, and so on. I think the problem is that there may not be enough money, that the parties in the last couple of cycles, uh, I think, have been raising corporate money um, for additional things, uh, and, then, and those contributions are not uh, part of the normal contributions and so on. So I suppose I might take the radical position that uh, the parties ought to get more money but the condition might be the same as in the general campaign, that if they take that money, they can't take any private money for the conventions. 
I, I think it's a good use for the money, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I would uh, hesitate to go very far in, uh, in subsidizing uh, parties uh, from the uh, uh, federal uh, level. Uh, I think that this is a legitimate uh, purpose that is, uh, is filled, and I think that uh, it's about as good a way for the federal government to be spending its money on parties as, uh, as any other. It's an entirely uh, other and larger question. I think if we went to a... Uh, uh, a national primary for electing delegates uh, to a convention, that it would make the, the conventions themselves more meaningful and would perhaps e even justify even more uh, uh, support from a governmental uh, level. But I, I think that the, the, the whole convention system, the whole selection uh, system needs to be uh, shaken up uh, somewhat. And, uh, but that is a, uh, a question for another day. I didn't know how much I agreed with Jerry until we had this panel, so I appreciate your having it. Uh, but, um, but in my written statement, what I didn't, what I didn't say today, that af after you move off of soft money, the next logical step for the question is uh, saying about uh, the, the nexus between presidential candidates and presidents and individual givers, obviously, is the national convention, private money, uh, inaugural committees, and transition committees. Uh, uh, there's just uh, the same kinds of issues. I, I agree. I think that... Um, that uh, the national conventions are, are important events bringing party people together. Uh, how much the money should be, I don't know. I have no problem with it being more if the trade-off is uh, you don't have the large contributors. Uh, I agree with my colleagues. Um, I, uh, I would like to raise one point, though. Bringing in the uh, uh, presidential election system and comparing it with congressional elections um, enables me to highlight one point. Presidential candidates have never suffered for lack of attention whether they be challengers or incumbents. Um, House candidates particularly, though, do suffer, uh, House challengers, from that lack of attention. And, and one of the keys we've all, I think, agree on is that we need to find, hopefully, some way to help challengers overcome what uh, often we could call the invisibility problem. And we believe, I, I think I speak for my colleagues, that political parties can be part of the solution to uh, helping challengers that way. Mr. Chairman, I just want to jump in here. I, I certainly uh, think that while public financing is something that we can argue about the value of, we all know it's not anytime soon, other than what we have in place, which frankly is one of the great secrets of American politics. I mean, the degree to which the presidential campaigns can be run without any recourse to special interest money, for whatever value that may or may not be, is sort of lost on the public. In fact, it seems to me, if anything, we could reinvest a little bit of money in promoting public participation through the checkoff, because here we are in a position where we're having a hard time not only funding our conventions, but at the same time making timely payments to our candidates for president. The participation rate has been dropping. It needs to come back up. It's been neglected, I think, to some degree by people who have really no great love for the law in the first place. But uh, I, I do think, you know, money into the campaigns through the parties is a great leavening effect, a positive effect on the political process. And I would uh, just like to say that I think two other things we have not thrown into the mix here today, and that is uh, the critique of the traditionally weak leadership of parties in Congress and the constant reference to the fact that we have to spend so much time raising money which uh, I, I think most members feel uh, are both addressed by giving the parties a, a greater role in helping candidates get here and stay here uh, without quite as much recourse to their own personal investment, in, in certainly in the latter case, or disinvestment in the party in the former case. So I think those, those are additional reasons why we've really got to look to the parties as an institution that will help restore some of the trust in the process here. I, I think that's very true, Mr. Fazio, and I, I think it is a real problem, the uh, amount of, uh, of time and, and effort uh, that the candidates and office holders are now uh, required to spend uh, raising money. And I think that strengthening the parties, as you say, is a way of dealing with that problem as well. Gentleman from Michigan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Two brief comments. First of all, I want to thank you for bringing this panel here. This has been one of the more enlightening discussions I've heard on this topic, and I really appreciate uh, the comments you made. Secondly, I wanted to pick up on something that uh, you said, Mr. Chairman, because I think that's uh, an extremely port of, important part of any solution. 
I also happen to think we should be strengthening the political parties. Uh, certainly they are far too weak at this point in the balance of things. And your suggestion of requiring that the majority of funding come from within a candidate's district, I think, is an extremely important principle that should be followed. Because I know from personal experience that's been a, a principal method of strengthening the local organizations. And I hope uh, if we do come up with some recommendations for change that we do incorporate that. Thank you. I want to thank the panel. Uh, I do believe you're representative. I think I know the field uh, well enough to make sure that the only bias is a regional one uh, because of the availability of folk. But if we could have gotten uh, Bibby or some of the West Coast folk, uh, they would have pretty much presented uh, uh, similar ideas. Um, I'm only going to ask you uh, to make sure that uh, when we try to contact you, and I will contact you with written options that we've been looking at uh, generated from this committee, that the turnaround time be as short as possible because, as you well know, when we make decisions, we begin to move and uh, would love to have uh, your input, at least your reaction, uh, to some of the suggested changes that we're going to be offering. And I want to thank the panel very much for your participation. Well, I'd do that. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, finally, as we've done uh, with other hearings, I want to uh, conclude the hearing with a, a panel of practitioners, people who are actually out doing what we've been talking about. Uh, and this panel consists of uh, Robert Bennett, who's the chairman of the Ohio Republican Party, James Brady, uh, who was alluded to as president of the Association of State Democratic Chairs. Stuart Regis is the former national director of the Libertarian Party. And Catherine Bannon is a uh, volunteer uh, with the Republican Party. Let me say to all of you uh, that any uh, written testimony that you may have will be made a part of the record, uh, and you may inform the committee uh, verbally in any way uh, that you see fit to enlighten us about uh, what you believe should be done in the area of campaign finance reform. Uh, and let me begin uh, on my left with Mr. Brady and simply move through uh, the panel. Mr. Brady. Uh, Chairman Thomas, Mr. Fazio, other members of the committee, I want to thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to appear before the committee today to address the most important but least understood aspects of campaign finance reform. That is the role of political parties in our electoral process. As the president of the Association of State Democratic Chairs, I am regularly reminded of how ignorant even our nation's opinion leaders are regarding political parties. If all you knew about our political parties is what you were able to glean from the popular press, you would conclude that political parties were mere shells through which enormous sums of money were laundered outside the public's eye for unscrupulous politicians. In fact, nothing could be further from the truth. Our two major political parties are amazingly open, not only to those who seek to participate, but to those who seek to scrutinize our activities. For the tens of millions who participate in our primaries, for the millions who participate in our caucuses and for the thousands who run our day-to-day -day affairs, being a Democrat or a Republican represents a continuing belief and commitment to our democracy. To those who fear that our parties are drawn to the shadows, let me assure them that we prefer the light. The detailed reporting that is required of our party committees at both the federal and state levels is a burden, and let there be no doubt that it is a huge burden but it is one that we freely accept. We have no quarrel with those who demand to know what we are up to. If you want to know where we get our money, it is there for all to see. How we spend it is no secret either. Our critics seldom acknowledge that a political party in comparison to a typical political action committee receives far greater scrutiny and is subject to far greater regulation. With your indulgence, let me give you a few examples. Unlike a corporate or labor pact, a political party committee is not allowed to pay its operating costs from unregulated Treasury dollars. And unlike the NRA or the National Abortion Rights League, a political party committee is not permitted to make independent expenditures. And unlike the AMA or the trial lawyers, a political party committee is restricted in communicating with its own members. The current regulatory scheme is indeed onerous, 
and regrettably a drag on party activity. The party is simply not a preferred player under the present law. Uh, I'm not here to complain, rather I have come to voice support for and to elicit your aid in strengthening our two-party system. This system has served our country well. It gives coherence to our politics. It takes desperate voices through a, a truly open and democratic process, reduces vast differences to two positions from which the electorate can rationally choose. Yes, at times, real disagreement is papered over within our parties. But to me, that is a strength, not a weakness. The internal debates that rage in our party caucuses allow real differences to be confronted. If full resolution is not always achieved, sufficient accommodation is made to make governing possible. One need only to look to the current budget debate to appreciate how well the two-party system, for all its messiness and imperfection, ends up representing the electorate with real choices, with real alternative visions. Our two-party system is a great antidote to single-interest politics. Only in a nightmare could I dream of swapping our two-party system for the chaos of so characteristic of a multi-party democracy. I truly believe that strengthening our two-party system should be among our highest priorities. As you may know, current law presents permit state and local party committees to conduct get-out-the-vote campaigns on behalf of their presidential nominees. Regrettably, there is no similar exemption for non-presidential elections. Extending this exemption would be a very positive step. It would free political parties to mobilize the electorate on behalf of all its candidates and in doing so invigorate our democracy. Many politicians, myself included, got their start in politics as volunteers going door to door or stuffing envelopes. We should do whatever we can to guarantee that this entry door to politics remains open. It is a value that extends beyond any election. Uh, I would encourage you to revisit the required volunteer component of the exemption and ref the refreshing the volunteer component to reflect current campaign techniques and technology would be beneficial. Current FEC guidelines are not helpful in assisting state parties in determining the level of volunteer activity. Additionally, parties now communicate with the electorate in ways unknown at the time of the law's enactment. Emails, fax trees, and internet are all tools of modern campaigns. Parties should be free to use these technologies to communicate with their members without falling afoul of the election law. I therefore would recommend that state and local committees be allowed to take out newspaper advertisements in support of their candidates without violating election law as well. I would go so far as to recommend that local committees be able to do so if this is their only federal activity without having to register and report to the Federal Election Commission. These are some of the, the suggestions uh, that I would make. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Mr. Bennett? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Members uh, would you uh, get a microphone so that you can talk directly into it there? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <clears throat> members of the committee, I want to again thank you for the opportunity to be here today to offer my views on federal campaign finance reform. I sit here not merely as an observer of politics, but as a full-time state party chairman who is very much affected by the federal election law on a daily basis. When considering federal campaign finance reform, I believe it is vital for the committee to keep in mind the far-reaching effects of the legislation you may pass. Legislation, that, unless carefully crafted, may in fact have an adverse effect on the democratic process rather than the goal of involving more citizens in elections. During your debate, I hope that you will keep in mind the role of political parties and in particular remember that we folks at the state and local level are involved in a lot more elections than just congressional and presidential races. In fact, the vast majority of our efforts have nothing to do with federal elections. Next year in Ohio, 19 congressional races in the presidential election constitute the federal portion of our efforts. This is contrasted by our involvement in over 900 state and local county races which is 98 percent of our activity next year. Despite this fact, the Federal Election Commission has determined through its allocation formula 
that 33 percent of all of our expenditures fall under federal guidelines. This is federal intrusion on local elections. Political parties are not the enemy in the public's battle against special interests. Parties are not special interests, but as stated before, rather a vehicle by which individuals with a common philosophy of governance can affect the democratic process. There is no other form through which the average citizen can have such a dramatic impact as through a political party. Political parties are a fundamental link to informed citizens. A vast majority of what we do is simply providing information to voters. We tell voters who our candidates are, where they stand on the issues, and encourage them to vote. By associating with a particular party platform, a candidate tells a voter a lot about himself or herself, which may assist the voter in making their choice. All of this contributes to an informed citizens, which is essential to a democracy. I know that the so-called soft money is highly controversial, but these funds are publicly reported along with all of our other contributions. The idea that these funds flow freely into political parties has absolutely no merit. It is just as difficult to go out and raise these funds as it is to raise any other type of contribution. Rather than some sinister plot to thwart free and fair elections, soft money is what gives us the resources to communicate with voters through things such as slate cards, absentee ballot applications, materials for volunteers to go door to door, and to get out the vote telephone calls. In Ohio, we have over 6.5 million registered voters. Next year, it was cost us in the neighborhood of $2 million to effectively communicate with these voters. That's a lot of money. But it is by no means as an attempt to buy an election or provide undue influence. Even spending $2 million statewide in Ohio is only about 31 cents per voter. I do not think that uh, our democracy would be better served by the parties not being able to spend the equivalent of a first-class postage stamp in order to inform voters about our candidates. As you go through this process of considering campaign finance reform, keep in mind that state and local county parties are already under a tremendous burden of regulation by the Federal Election Commission. Many of our county parties want to run slate ads in their local newspapers in order to identify their local candidates with our candidates for Congress or Senate. Newspaper ads with federal candidates are considered mass communications under FEC guidelines and are therefore subject to federal election law. Before counties can run a uh, slate ad, they must check with the state party to ensure that we have not gone over the $5,000 expenditure limit for the candidate since the county party and state party contributions are cumulative under federal law. This means that we must track the activity of each individual county to ensure that combined their newspaper advertising does not exceed our limit. This is another bureaucratic nightmare. In 1988, we had four county parties that ran a newspaper slate advertisement with the picture of George Bush at the top of the ticket. The ads cost a total of about $400, but were considered illegal contributions to a presidential candidate under federal election law. The state party intervened on behalf of the county parties, and the Bush presidential campaign reimbursed the $400. But even so, it still cost us almost $5,000 in legal fees to clear up the matter. The whole process started as nothing more than local political organizations trying to inform voters who their candidates were and literally ended up as a federal case. Do we really think democracy is better served by the federal election commission telling county parties they can't run ads, including their presidential, senate, or congressional candidates. This is the type of bureaucracy that I'm suggesting needs to be reformed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bennett. Mr. Regis, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd just like to highlight the major points from my written testimony. Uh, I'm here representing the Libertarian Party today. Uh, the Libertarian Party has been in existence for over 24 years. And for most of that time, we've had the status of America's largest third party. 
Uh, in each of the last five presidential elections, we received the highest vote total of any third party. And in the last election, presidential election, we were the only third party to make it on all 50 state ballots. Uh, you hear a lot of talk these days about reducing the size and scope of government. Well, that's been the libertarian mission all along. Uh, we would go a lot further than most people. If we had our way, uh, we would have you completely repeal the Federal Election Campaign Act of 1971, eliminate all the public funding of campaigns, and abolish the Federal Election Commission. But I doubt you're willing to take steps that drastic, so we've made some more modest suggestions. Uh, I think it's important to understand the role that third parties have historically had in this country. Uh, third parties traditionally have brought issues to the forefront that are not being addressed by the politicians in Washington. I think that was most clear really in the 1992 election. Ross Perot was able to galvanize a lot of support and get his 19% of the popular vote because he was talking about issues that really mattered to people and that were not being discussed by the, the major party candidates. So I think it's important for American democracy that we continue to have third parties and independent candidates. And I think the American public also understands this point, uh, which is why at this point in time polls consistently show that over two-thirds of Americans are fed up with the two-party system and would like to see some new th third party form. So I think it's very important that you consider third parties in any reforms that, that you would pass. Uh, try to make sure that in limiting the major parties you don't end up suffocating the third parties. Uh, I think it's also important to understand the obstacles that third parties face. Uh, very few Americans realize the problems that third parties have, have to come up against because basically when it comes to doling out favors, the third parties are shut out of the process. When it comes out to, uh, to uh, doling out burdens, though, to place on, on parties, suddenly everybody thinks that we should be equal and that third parties should be treated the same as everybody else. So what that means is that we have to function in an environment where we have none of the benefits and all of the costs uh, of being a major party. Uh, to give you a simple example of that, consider a presidential race where we had a hypothetical Democrat and Republican and a third party candidate. Uh, one of the biggest differences would be in the area of ballot access. The Democrat and Republican could expect to get on the state ballots automatically in most states of the union. And in those few states where they would have to petition, it would be a very small petition requirement. The third party candidate, on the other hand, would have to petition in virtually every state of the union with a very high petition requirement. Uh, to get on all 50 state ballots, the third party candidate would have to raise over 800,000 petition signatures, which is 15 to 30 times what any Republican or Democrat would have to obtain. Uh, when it comes to the nominating convention, the Republican and Democrat can expect to get $12 million directly from the U.S. Treasury to pay for their nominating convention. The third party would have to raise their own funds to pay for their convention. And if the Democrat or Republican won their party's nomination, they'd again be given money from the U.S. Treasury, $60 million to run their campaign whereas the third party candidate would have to rely on individual contributions to run their campaign. But when it comes to reporting requirements, suddenly we decide that the third party candidates have to live under the exact same FEC rules as the major party candidates and have to file the exact same set of FEC reports. There are a lot of people in our party who think that this is a deliberate attempt on the part of the major parties to eliminate their competition. And I think that there's a lot of evidence, at least at the state level, that in ballot access this is actually the case. But uh, I tend to think that in the federal area, it's not so much a deliberate attempt. And Mr. Chairman, you mentioned uh, in your opening comments the idea of unintended consequences, and I think we're an excellent example of that. Uh, I had the opportunity in 1993 to testify before the commissioners of the FEC, and uh, this was a great opportunity for me to try to find out what they thought about third parties. And uh, I was a little surprised to find that they think nothing about us, we, literally nothing. I mean, uh, uh, when it comes to deciding on new regulations to impose, they think about, well, how will it affect the Democrats, how will it affect the Republicans, and they literally don't think about us at all. Uh, but the commissioners very rightly pointed out to me that they have no authority to change the regulatory burden placed on third parties, that only Congress has that authority. And so we believe this is the, the most promising area where you could help out third parties, is in easing some of the, some of the burdens that are placed on third parties. Uh, there are two major areas that, that we wanted to focus on. The first is the area of uh, contribution limits. Uh, virtually every other speaker today has discussed this issue, so I don't think I need to go into it at length, but uh, we think it's time to raise the limits. They were set 20 years ago. Inflation has uh, eroded them by about a factor of three since that time. It's particularly galling to a third party like ourselves in the general election for the presidential race, because in that election, the major party candidates get their money directly from the Treasury, and that money is indexed to inflation. So 
20 years ago, they were getting $20 million. Now, in 1996, they'll each be getting over $60 million. So while the major party candidates are getting more and more money each time in the general election, we're living under these shrinking contribution limits and are allowed to have a smaller and smaller pool of money to work with. So this was an example of, of where a very simple change would affect us, and it would have virtually no effect on the major party candidates because they get their money directly from the Treasury. The other area that we wanted to discuss was easing the reporting requirements for third parties. Uh, we've reached a point where the federal law is so restrictive and so complex that any third party starting up really has to spend at least 5% of its budget on, uh, just on compliance issues. It may not sound like a lot of money, but for a small grassroots organization, 5% is a lot of money. Uh, in 1992, the Libertarian Party spent almost as much money on compliance as it did on TV ads. So again, we think there are areas where Congress can make a difference. The $200 uh, reporting threshold that uh, has been used for the past 20 years could be indexed to inflation. Uh, it's, it's interesting that, the, as with any membership organization, we have a skewed population of donors. So there are many donors at the low end, a smaller number at the high end. So as that number has, as that threshold has moved lower and lower, we've picked up actually quite a bit more people that have to be itemized every time on our, on our FEC reports. So uh, even a simple change like increasing it by a factor of three would actually reduce our reports by a factor of 10. Uh, if you're not willing to increase the, the, those uh, thresholds across the board, another idea that we think you should consider is having a different regulatory requirement for minor parties. You already have a different, a different requirement, uh, a different uh, distinction made for uh, benefits that are given out to the parties. Why not have a different regulatory uh, uh, standard as well? Uh, one of the suggestions we've given is, suppose you had a $1,000 limit for the minor parties. That would greatly simplify the amount of work that we had to do, but at the same time, if we ended up winning a congressional race, you'd still have some uh, way to track the, the major money influences. Uh, I know that these aren't the most common ideas that people are discussing. Uh, we could have come here and said, get rid of PAC money, get rid of soft money, which would have probably helped us in the long run, but uh, we're ideologically opposed to that, so uh, we can't support that. Uh, we're also opposed to any congressional uh, funding, I mean, uh, uh, federal funding of congressional races. Uh, Harry Brown, one of our presidential candidates, is qualified for presidential matching funds. He could, as of today, ask for $300,000 from the U.S. Treasury, but he's not going to because uh, no matter how important we think our message is, we're not willing to force the taxpayers to pay for it. Uh, but by, by opting out of the matching funds program, we're at even more of a disadvantage than we would be otherwise. We want you to help out third parties, but we're not asking for a handout, and we don't want you to regulate us or our opponents to death. Just get out of the way by increasing the contribution limits and by easing the regulatory burdens on, on us, and we'll take it from there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Regis. Uh, based upon the limitations on your party, that's one of the reasons I thanked you for being here uh, today so that we can uh, learn from your experience. And now uh, an actual real volunteer, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to uh, schedule it. Uh, we had... Um, uh, thought we were going to have both the Democrat and Republican uh, volunteers, and it simply didn't work out that way. Uh, but Ms. Bannon, as you talk about your volunteer activities uh, within the Republican Party, I think uh, most people who are familiar with the volunteer activities would agree that it's very similar uh, in the Democratic Party I'm, as well. I'm sure they are. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, good afternoon. My name is Kate Bannon, and I'm pleased to appear before the House Oversight Committee this afternoon to speak with you about my activities as a volunteer for the Republican Party. I studied political science in college, and I earned a master's degree in legislative affairs, so I have a strong knowledge base in the political process and its procedure. However val valuable this education is, it doesn't tell the whole story and does not always explain how and why government works on a daily basis. My parents were not active in party politics, but they did instill in me the strong belief that it's important for every citizen to vote. However, it was not until after college that I truly realized the strength and importance of democracy. My first job after college was in Central America, where I lived and worked for two and a half years. During this time, I witnessed and lived through the effects of two coup d'etats and a state of siege during which all civil liberties were suspended. Because of these experiences, I greatly appreciate the unique character of American democracy. Americans have the right to freedom of speech and thought and to elect our government by secret ballot. I'm saddened that many Americans take these gifts and rights for granted and often choose not to participate in government at any level. It's easy to complain about government, the system, or the individuals who are involved in it, but there is a remedy, and that's participation. I choose to participate and to actively help decide my own future. 
participation in a political party empowers us as individuals. Because of this belief, I have volunteered for the Republican Party for the last several years at the state, local, and national levels. I choose to work for the Republican Party because I believe that it represents and respects the rights of individuals and their ability to make decisions for themselves that will affect their lives. I started volunteering because of my ongoing interest in politics, but also to meet people and to become more actively involved in my community. I've worked on several campaigns. My activities have been quite varied and have included handing out literature at shopping malls, participating in literature drops in my hometown of Arlington, Virginia, walking with candidates around my neighborhood, planning fundraising events, writing personal checks to candidates, attending political conventions, stuffing and stamping envelopes, donating office supplies, assisting in writing candidate position papers, providing data entry, answering telephones, participating in phone banks to remind citizens to vote. In other words, lending a hand where and when it's needed. The pace is often intense and the hours are long, but there's always work to be done and even small contributions make a difference and are always appreciated. I'm also a member of the Arlington County Republican Committee where I've served additionally on the finance and outreach subcommittees. I'm an appointed member of the Arlington County Board's Committee on the Status of Women and I'm currently in my second term. My volunteer work has strengthened my belief that active participation by citizens is a necessary and important component of American democracy. My volunteer work has made me more aware of the opportunities that exist for individuals to contribute to improving Americans' lives. Government is not a remote entity that exists in Washington or in the state capitals. It's a part of all of our lives. I've devoted a lot of time and energy to my activities, but I've also received much in return. I look forward to continuing my work with the Republican Party and to making my contribution. Once again, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak with you, and I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Ben. Uh, gentleman from California. Chair, I just uh, wanted to reiterate the uh, statement you made earlier that we as always have been given equal time here. Another Arlington, Virginia volunteer, Mr. Tom Whipple, was originally scheduled to appear and was unable to at the last moment. I understand he's performed a tremendous amount of volunteer work for our party in Virginia, particularly with respect to updating computer systems, volunteer programs, and voting lists. And of course, we regret on our side that he was unable to share his experiences today. And we hope he'll be able to submit some testimony that will illustrate how technology can be used to expand participation uh, among volunteers. I guess it's uh, indicative of the civic culture of Arlington that both our volunteers were from the same community. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Um, what I wanted to try to point out, though, was uh, originally stated by the National Party chairs as they described the so-called national parties that, frankly, are a confederation of state parties. Uh, and that when you look at the state parties, they're frankly a confederation to a very great extent um, of uh, local structures. Uh, and in that sense, uh, Mr. Regis, I think you'll find a, a great deal of sympathy among folk who represent state and local people in trying to deal with the myriad regulations that have been placed, I think, without a, a great deal of thought uh, on the burdens that it imposes. Uh, on people trying to do what they believe they're supposed to be doing. Uh, you need to know that I believe that the third parties do play an important role in the system. Uh, most often they've been either issues or personality type third parties. I think in 92 it might have been a combination uh, of both. I think it's important that third parties uh, have an easier role in the system because frankly they highlight uh, areas of concern among the electorate faster sometimes than would be the case coming through the major parties. And that if we allow for a flexibility for third parties, uh, when the pot boils, we know it faster in that way. And what has happened historically is that the major parties then examine those opportunities, and it hasn't always been the same major party, but inevitably one of the two major parties begin to move uh, in the direction of that pressure if they believe it has merit and especially if there are larger numbers moving in that direction. So I strongly support your concern uh, for third parties. I think it's good for the system. The gentleman from California mentioned that the Democratic volunteer was involved uh, more in technology. Do you believe that that is an out for a third parties more so than it used to be given the, the difficulty in complying, uh, the computerization uh, of reports and the ability to file now 
um, electronically with the Federal Election Commission. Is that an area, do you think, that we could work together on to, to create perhaps a simpler way of uh, doing business for you uh, and nevertheless have you meet the requirements of information? Well, I'm not sure um, that that ends up easing the burden very much. I mean, there are endless examples that I could give. I mean, part of the problem is having to track down, for example, employer and occupation information for anybody who even gives $5 to your party. Uh, if you set up a worldwide web page, for example, to advertise your party, you have to be sure to say paid for by such and such and ask for employer and occupation if they give you a dollar to buy a bumper sticker. I mean, uh, the, the burdens that are placed on us by the FEC are really, just, I mean, well, by Congress are, are just enormous. Uh, I don't believe that computerizing it ends up helping us all that much. You still need to have someone on staff who understands these rules and tries to make sure that you're in compliance and someone else who can actually prepare these reports or computerize them in that way and then a printer that just prints all night long to you know, end up generating the, the, the many pages you're going to submit to the FEC. Well, and I think possibly as the Libertarian Party is in the worst of all possible worlds because some of your suggestions about reversing the burdens versus the benefits uh, one of the reasons I, I was anxious to have you is that you do have a broad representation across the country and that there are many minor, minor third parties uh, that might be able to benefit from a lightening of the load and I would be interested in using you as a sounding board as we look at possible uh, options so that you could give us a feel uh, for the hurdle, not so much from a philosophical point of view but from a practical uh, reporting point of view. A gentleman from California. I, I guess we're, we're both going to uh, direct questions initially to Mr. Regis. I, I wanted to know why, uh, and, and this I suppose gives you an opportunity to expand on your party's philosophy, uh, you oppose disclosure, which I think you indicate you see as the lesser of several evils, but yeah. which uh, most people who have testified here today think is the bedrock upon which we ought to build reform, and frankly many who believe in it think we ought not to go much further. But I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts on that subject. Well, I think libertarians feel that uh, individuals should be allowed to do with their money what they choose to do with it without having the federal government or you know, their, the, their neighbors watching what they are doing. I think that uh, libertarians uh, are, are upset about the idea that if I want to give a certain amount of money to a federal candidate, that that information is going to be listed on a report that's available at the Federal Election Commission. My name may appear in the newspaper tomorrow morning especially with the kind of uh, media coverage that we get these days where that is turned into something, you know, uh, very sour. This person is uh, trying to corrupt this federal, uh, this federal uh, official. So, uh, you know, as, as I had mentioned, uh, the, the limits prevent us from getting our message out, which is worse, but even the disclosure uh, laws are, are uh, 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 something that we do not like. Let me ask you about the nuance of, of a backdoor approach, perhaps, to public financing. If we did provide a subsidy through the revenue foregone in the Postal Service if we were to perhaps provide access to the airwaves. Uh, are any of these devices sufficient to overcome your uh, philosophical objections to uh, public financing to incur I, your interest in using them? In or would you still find yourself behind the curve as you are in so many other areas of campaign law? Well, in preparing for, for this hearing, I, I looked over the various bills that are before Congress right now, and there were a lot of different ideas that people had of trying to get at that uh, uh, backdoor way of funding. Uh, none of them really were acceptable to us. Uh, we don't like the idea of forcing uh, broadcast stations to, to show uh, TV commercials for free. Uh, we don't like the idea of making people who use the Postal Service subsidize candidates who are going to then be able to send out free mailings. Uh, None, none of those were ideas that really appealed to us. Mr. Chairman, if I could continue, and I apologize to my colleagues, I'd like to, to ask the, uh, the two uh, state chairs. You both made the same point about the inability to run newspaper ads that uh, would endorse the general principles of the party and I uh, suppose uh, generally promote the slate, top to bottom, what have you. And it really brings up the broader question of how you can bifurcate federal and state and local elections, which the law really kind of asks you to do. Uh, would you speak to the broader question, and I think we'd be sympathetic with fixing the problem you both pointed out, but how can we, under current federal law, promote more party loyalty, discipline, exposure 
advocacy when we have to live with the obvious difficulty of, in, in effect, helping candidates running up and down the ballot whenever we, through slate cards or what have you, try to promote activity for the party where people live at the local level, at the lowest level of democracy. Is there a way out of this dilemma? I'd be interested in your reactions in both cases. I don't know that there's, there's any way that you can really, you know, reconcile it with this without just removing, you know, the, the restrictions all the way around. Uh, but it is just, you know, it's patently almost ab absurd to be faced in this, in these situations. I mean, we, uh, you know, have to face them all the time. In fact, we've gone so far in, 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 in my home state of just, you know, asking and, and, you know, making sure that our, our parish committees, our, which correspond to county committees, uh, you know, just don't do any activity, you know, whatsoever of a, of, in a presidential race of, that involves, you know, any real expenditure. Uh, and it, it gives them very little, you know, to form. And then you ask why, you know, people don't want to participate uh, if you can't allow them to do something like simply running a slate that has a presidential candidate on it, it's, it's very discouraging. I just don't have a, a real solid answer to, to get to you. There's nothing more stimulative of political activity normally than the presidential campaign, which yeah. seems yeah. to reach down to people who may not be active in local civic affairs, who may not go out and vote for school board or city council. Be happy to hear from Mr. Bennett. Uh, Mr. Fazio, that's a good question. The fact of the matter is, is in Ohio that uh, out of our 88 counties, as I would, I would guess that 75 percent of them just opt out of doing anything in the presidential or uh, the uh, uh, any federal elections, and that they rely on either the candidate's campaign committee or the state party to uh, perform that uh, uh, function for them. And I think that that's, uh, that's unfortunate, but that's the reality of it. We spend a lot of time educating our county chairman on what federal election law is, what they can do, what they cannot do in a federal election. And as we move into the presidential year, uh, that becomes uh, even more important because the restrictions are even tighter. Uh, your county, local county committees cannot even purchase or, or uh, 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 print up some bumper stickers or uh, campaign cards to hand out on any of the federal candidates without it being a uh, go against the uh, contribution limits. So I, I think that perhaps a way you ask the question is how would you address this? I think that there ought to be some exemption, uh, for a certain dollar exemption uh, uh, for the local county parties and what they can do on behalf of federal candidates. And I think that that would probably help uh, a great deal to eliminate uh, uh, the confusion and really what is uh, uh, the animosity that exists sometimes at the local level towards federal candidates, particularly within the party structure, because they're unable to do these things. Thank you very much. Gentleman from Michigan, wish to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fazio has asked the one question I was going to ask, so uh, we'll jump just to a comment in support of Mr. Regis's observation about indexing campaign limits, or contribution limits, and, and particularly. Uh, indexing the requirements for reporting. Uh, I can assure you that it's fully as burdensome for an individual candidate to have to do that as it is for a third party. Uh, we have limited resources too and it, uh, it occupies a tremendous amount of volunteer time, particularly tracking down professions or places of employment and things of this sort, which is often left off when a contribution is received. And uh, I, I have yet to discover any really meaningful reason for requiring reporting of that for so many individuals. Uh, presumably there's some sort of linkage between that and the influence that they might want to uh, exert on us, but it's, it's just totally out of proportion to the danger and the amount of record keeping that is required, the length of the reports uh, is, is just... Uh, I don't see that it serves any public purpose, so I certainly support your request on that score. The gentleman and I share is perhaps remiss in not uh, allowing the gentleman from Ohio, uh, who has an interest in one of the, 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 the panel members' presence here, uh, have come in earlier, but I uh, apologize, Mr. Nay, didn't see you come in. Gentleman from Ohio, wish to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank all the panelists for being here, and of course, uh, my party chairman, Bob Bennett, uh, for being here. and. Uh, 
I guess I wouldn't have had the opportunity to be here if it wasn't for uh, Bob Bennett because you talked me into this, as you well know, which shows party involvement. And some days I have fun thoughts of you, and some days I have thoughts of you, Bob, so out here. But um, I think the involvement of the, of the political parties and, and any uh, uh, political party that can come about is a, obviously a good thing. What I wanted to, I guess, uh, zero in just a, a comment and maybe a comment back and from Bob in, uh, and anybody else would like to comment on the uh, involvement of the parties at the local levels. But, you know, the one thing I would point out in your testimony uh, for Chairman Bennett, you have uh, an example of the $5,000 in legal fees you had to pay because of a county organization. I know as a candidate, and I'm sure my colleagues have, have run into this, you know, my campaign manager last time, Mike Carey, called me up. Uh, I had to call local party leaders. They were incensed. They were angry. They felt their rights were taken away. They couldn't put our name in an ad. And you go through that. And then you have to be the one that calls. And, and I know we called the state party many a time. Would you call and explain? And also it goes beyond that, because you can educate the party chairs, but then you've got the head of the Young Democrats, the head of the Young Republicans, and they want to take out ads. So I think it's a, it's a real problem to turn around and tell people you, you, you can't express your voice. And what you went through there in Ohio, I think, is, uh, you know, extremely bad, and you end up having to pay 5000 bucks because it's almost impossible to monitor all those chairmen. So on that, uh, the one question I would ask is, do you advocate then, uh, you say, um, putting certain limits uh, uh, county by county, or what would be the, I'd like to hear from the chairman, what would be your way of doing that? Just not have a limit, or? Well, uh, Congressman Nays, I think that uh, what I would advocate is right now, the counties, uh, any contributions that the counties make on behalf of federal candidates counts against the state's uh, uh, limitation. And in 1994, where we had, uh, in some cases, maxed out on our limitation, uh, our contribution to uh, federal candidates, uh, and we're unable to make any other contributions, any county party contribution at that level then would be uh, an illegal contribution under federal election uh, uh, law and would be subject to a complaint being filed. I would advocate that we have some type of, of uh, uh, exemption for local county parties and, and perhaps the auxiliary parties, such as, uh, uh, in your case, the Young Republicans or, or the uh, uh, city uh, uh, committees that uh, could do certain things that did not exceed a certain dollar amount. Uh, I would like to see those limits being uh, uh, perhaps uh, set at a, an amount that uh, uh, would, be, uh, would encourage them to do something, but maybe not too much. Uh, to uh, uh, encourage them to at least do the normal things that they would normally do, include yeah. them in slate cards, include them in, in which is exempt, but, but include them in, in their local advertisements that they send out. And if they want to pitch, put a picture of the congressman or, or their Senate uh, candidate, let them go ahead and do that. Mr. Brady? Yes, I'd, I would agree with that, uh, the exemptions. And then uh, to answer uh, Mr. Fazio's question before, one of the, the things that was mentioned here this morning is just do away with the limits. I mean, that's, uh, you know, that would solve uh, a great deal of this. But there certainly ought to be, uh, you know, exemption for what a party and its affiliates can do for its, its candidates. I mean, in, in any form. And this is not an, a, a, you know, a tru intrusive way. I mean, it's not a, uh, an expensive way to run, you know, ads and slate cards. This should be where it really is. I mean, you know, this is the grassroots at the, at the, at the bottom level almost. And uh, certainly an exemption or, or no limits at all would be very well. Uh, Mr. Regis, uh, one question I had, I, I thought I gathered from your testimony that you, in fact, would not, you don't support disclosure. We, we would prefer not to see disclosure, but of the two, disclosure and limits, we'd rather see limits removed. I mean, we, we'd rather see the whole FEC go. I mean, we'd rather see all of it gone, so, yeah. um, <laughs> I have one other question. Not necessarily I, in that order. If, if I could. Um, I'd like to ask, uh, because we have, a, as uh, Bob Bennett knows, in Ohio, we have, a, I think, a good uh, checkoff system that we legislature worked uh, with both party chairmen at that time, and uh, I think that's healthy. It uh, gives the parties a lot of activity, and they, they want to go out and obviously encourage people to participate in both political parties. 
But could you expand just a little bit uh, off of the, uh, away from non-federal candidates, what you do as a party? Well, most of it, as, as uh, Chairman Bennett indicated, most of what we do doesn't involve federal candidates. I mean, we, uh, we run headquarters, we do, uh, we do polling, we do direct mail, we do candidate recruitment, we do uh, fundraising, we do uh, volunteer training, we do communications, we do uh, the whole gambit of uh, what uh, get out the vote, what parties are supposed to do. And the majority of this is, is directed uh, at local candidates, non-federal uh, candidates. And we do this uh, in, in large part with uh, state regulated, you know, funds. And that's the term that I think, you know, that, that's overlooked. That people, you know, talk about soft money, sewer money, or whatever it is. All of that is state regulated funds that we use to, to run our operations. But we do the whole myriad of, of how you got involved, the example you used about your chairman, you know, recruiting you. That's just part of what we do. Well, I, I think, first of all, is I'm not advocating the elimination of federal campaign regulations. I strongly supported uh, campaign finance reform in Ohio, and we had a bill passed uh, uh, this year that had uh, contribution limits. And at the same time, it strengthened the parties by increasing those uh, limits for the parties uh, on uh, what they could uh, receive from uh, contributors. Uh, into a campaign fund, while at the same time um, uh, eliminating the requirements uh, for operating purposes and other party building activities. So there are no limits on that, which I think is going to directly uh, strengthen uh, both parties in Ohio, the, uh, uh, the Republican and the Democrat Party. However, uh, uh, doing all the things that, uh, that Jim mentioned that the parties have a responsibility to do, right now, uh, state parties uh, need to have a, a staff attorney on to interpret the regulations. They need to have, uh, and we do have a certified public accountant right now that's our chief financial officer of the state party to allocate all the funds into the different pots that, uh, uh, so that you are in compliance with both uh, federal and the state law. What has become more burdensome, I think, to the party, and, and I agree with uh, uh, Jim, that 98 percent of our activities next year are going to be at the state and local level, but what's become burdensome has been really the tremendous amount of federal regulation. Let me give you an example. Back in 1980, I never heard of the Federal Election Commission getting in, involved into what state parties had spent or auditing or doing any intensive auditing. Uh, they concentrated on the presidential campaigns. Uh, sometime in the mid-1980s, they started taking a real hard look at the parties around 1985 and 86. And I think that as the staff continued to grow at the Federal Election Commission, they had to find additional uh, things to do. So that now we're down to where uh, the Federal Election Commission looks at local county parties. The four counties that I cited in Ohio were all relatively small counties with populations under 50,000 people were part of larger congressional district, larger Senate, state Senate districts, and larger House districts in Ohio. And uh, all they're trying to do is to do those volunteer activities and those things that they normally do to help elect candidates at the local level, and they fell afoul of the federal election law. Cost us a lot of money to correct that. Yeah. You know, just in closing, Mr. Chairman, just a, a comment I'd like to make. And, I, and just to touch on that, though, first, uh, I, I think it's, you know, it's bad. You've got a small county, they're trying to get involved in the process and they, they end up getting, you know, fined uh, uh, potentially an outrageous amount of money. I, I just think it makes a bad taste in the mouth. But um, I, I want to correct that. There was no fines involved in this. No. Is, uh, we were able to unwind because of the amount of money that was involved, $400. We were able to unwind yeah. it and then with the promise that we would never okay. do this again and but, that we would control all 88 counties in Ohio but, but and not do this be, again, we wouldn't get a fine. But you could be fined or you could have a fine situation. You know. In fact, no fining because you had to pay the, the, the attorney to leave. To mm -hmm. well, you know, the one, the one thing I harp on all the time, and I don't know what's right or wrong on this, but level playing field, you want to talk about the real power in, uh, in politics that, that could be. You, you've got a, a county party 
And whether it's Democrat or Republican committee, they are limited. Yet an individual can sit there and give as much as they want and for a congressional candidate because it's an independent expenditure that a congressional candidate has no awareness of it. So the individual, I as an individual, if I wasn't in Congress, could spend all I wanted in, in my home county of Belmont, yet the Belmont County Republican Party would be limited. That's not a level playing field. The second thing I think is that we all live under certain restraints or whatever Congress passes down the road. You have to have your money from within your district or, you know, whatever this finally comes out to be, but we live under certain restraints. Yet if you're a multimillionaire, not to pick on multimillionaires, but if you're a multimillionaire, you can put as much into your campaign as you please. And you have a constitutional right to do that, I guess, obviously, but in fact, that's not a level playing field. And I, I just think that if a limit is a limit, no matter where that money's coming from, and there, there again, you would allow a certain class of people to really be controlling elections possibly. So I think we have to, you know, proceed with caution with what we do to make sure it is a fair level playing field. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, one of the things that I... Go ahead. Would, would you mind if I uh, address just a minute longer this issue of disclosure? Uh, sure. Since both Mr. Fazio and Mr. Ney have raised it. Uh, I don't want to leave you the impression that libertarians find it outrageous that we have to tell you who gives money and how much they... I mean, we'd, we'd, we'd rather not see it happen, but that's not something that we, that we uh, uh, curse the federal government for doing. I think it's more the form that those disclosure laws take and the practical impact it has on the party. Uh, under current rules, the, the best efforts guidelines say that when someone goes over $200 in a calendar year, you have to report their employer and occupation. And if you have a party like ours where individual contributors do not want to provide that information, you're in trouble because the FEC says that if, if they, when they reach that point, if you don't have their employer and occupation information to provide, in order to have satisfied best efforts, you have to show that every ting single time you solicited money from them, you asked for employer and occupation. So if they bought a dollar bumper sticker, you asked for employer and occupation. They phoned in a $25 dues payment on their credit card, you had to have asked for employer and occupation. So every single small $1, $2 transaction the party does, we have to be sure to be asking for that FEC information so that, so that at, the, at the back end, you know, when they go over the $200 limit, we, we've met the requirements. Uh, I mean, one simple thing that you, you could consider, uh, starting in 1994, the FEC said that we have to do a separate follow-up mailing when people go over that $200 threshold. We still don't have their employer and occupation information. So that's now a new burden that every month we have to send out people letters saying, what is your employer and occupation? Why not just have that be the way of soliciting employer and occupation? Not worry about the $1, $2, $25 contributions, just if you allowed us to do this follow-up mailing and only the follow-up mailing, then disclosure would be a lot less burdensome than it is currently. Uh, so I mean, it's, it's more the practical effect of disclosure for us than, than the fact of disclosure. I would just tell you that some of my concerns are that uh, all of the money that you spend uh, during the year and over the years uh, at the state and local level uh, working on that party structure and the information and the coordination and the leadership and the communication is like practice. And then when it's time to play the game during the election time, the restrictions are such that many of these folk at the local level who spent all this time getting ready to play, it appears to them as though they aren't able to play because of the rules that don't make a lot of sense to people. And I think at some point we need to look at the value of the rules versus uh, the diminished interest in the system by people who have spent a lot of their volunteer time. And that's why I guess uh, for the last word I'd uh, like to hear from Ms. Bannon because oftentimes uh, people who are not involved in this process from a volunteer point of view think it's taking medicine. Uh, and I just wonder from, from your reaction whether in fact uh, it's become uh, social as well as uh, political. And what have you gotten out of this uh, personally, although obviously from a civic point of view the society in Arlington has benefited from your involvement. Uh, how do you see it from a personal point of view? Well, it is, uh, it, it's actually it's a lot of fun. It, it's a lot of work, but uh, I enjoy working, and I think you become more aware of how necessary it is to participate. Um, again, you can't just sit around and say, this thing is terrible or that thing's terrible. I think you do need to participate, and it's a good chance to work with a lot of different people that normally I probably wouldn't see at different ages and parts of uh, the world, and, and it's great. It's been a lot of fun, and I think we should all participate. Thank you very much. Any additional comments from my colleagues? If not, I want to thank uh, this panel especially for what you do in terms of 
uh, bolstering the party structure from the grassroots, and uh, the committee is adjourned. Neither the House nor the Senate has begun floor debate on campaign finance reform. The House returns today at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Members expect to consider fiscal year 96.